Come on live in three, two, one, go. Welcome, Dr. Raros Kachoba. Yes, sir. Nice to meet you, sir. Did I blow it? No, no. Perfect pronunciation. All right, great. Um, thanks so much for coming on the Technocrat Live. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Um, so uh, I, I was I had a Lee on the show two episodes ago, and he said I have a friend who's a doctor who would be perfect for your show, and then he told me that you said it's on like Donkey Kong after he asked you. Is that true? <laughs> Sound like Donkey Kong. All right, nice, perfect. Um, so b before we start, I just there was a, just a couple of things, a couple of news blips I wanted to bring up, real quick. Some th interesting things. I just wanted to say that this is actually I saw one of my first wild uh, Bitcoin ATMs. So uh, it was this was a few weeks ago now, and I just walked into a gas station. There's a Bitcoin ATM there. So this is the first time this has happened to me in the New York area. I, they, they've been around for years, but I just kind of an interesting thing for the, uh, the Bitcoin nerds watching. Uh, and also, um, <coughs> if you're into podcasting or into this streaming kind of space, um, Twitch just put something up on their site. They have an upload deadline in a week. So on March 11th, they're not allowing uploads anymore if you're not an affiliate. They just want... Uh, they just want... Um, uh, um, they want uh, uh, not affiliates, they want uh, only live streams, which is kind of strange, but uh, whatever. Anyway, so if you're on Twitch, that's, uh, that might be important to you. Um, oh, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Toscano and uh, Little Neck and Great Neck. Thank you for the free pizza. I accept free pizza. <laughs> yeah, you had some of that. How was the pizza? It was very good. All right, see? It's very good. All right. They're experts at the thin crust. So, so now you know it's for real. All right, so um, uh, I haven't actually had a doctor on the show before, so um, I had to kind of come up with an alternative list, a lot of the same topics, but with different angles. So to me, it's pretty obvious that our society, all right, the premise of the show is the technocracy rules, and who rules the technocracy but the technocrats. And the technocrats are the technical experts in various fields. Now, technocrats are old. They've been as old as uh, um, the markets in the, um, in the 30s, the 20s and the 30s. And uh, the idea was that uh, um, they, would, they would just, they knew more about the market mechanisms and algorithms, I didn't call them algorithms back then, that they used to determine prices of things than anyone else could. And literally no one else was even capable of understanding it. And therefore they ran the show. So I think that whether they were right then or not, I think they were, we're definitely in a technocracy now. And I'm not sure how I feel about that. We can talk about that if you want. But for sure, doctors, mechanics, um, uh, uh, like people in the movie business, people in the music business, computer geeks, they're all technocrats, right? They know things that other people would have to study for years and years and years to even grasp the concepts of. So I'm trying to bridge that gap a little bit. But also talk about the implications of that. Um, how does that sit with you? Does that make sense or does any of that seem untrue? No, it makes perfect sense. The, the only issue I see here is that we took a tool the technology, it's a tool, whatever, you know, the computer's a tool, the electronic medical record's a tool, everything's a tool, Right. but it seems that we've let the tool become the builder almost. Right. And what's going to happen, one day the electricity... That's will, literally happening. Literally. Yes. And one day, uh, like I tell my students, one day the electricity is going to go out. <laughs> you're, you're not going to have an MRI machine, you're not going to have a sonogram machine, you're going to have your hands, you're going to have a stethoscope. Probably someone's going to be, when the electricity goes out in about 20 years, uh, someone's going to be um, r rummaging through the basement of the hospital, going through boxes, going, God damn, I saw a stethoscope here somewhere. Right. No one's going to be or using More likely a pill full, a bottle full of antibiotics. <laughs> Yeah, which will probably be expired anyway, but at least something's better than nothing. Actually, expired medications, they, uh, they, someone did a study on them. Um, the, they found a whole big lot of expired medications, and most of them were pretty okay after five years. Really? Yeah, like, okay. like EpiPens. Mm -hmm. After five years past the expiration date, about 80% still effective. So, so don't ask me how I know this, but I know at, at the nest... <sighs> Uh, the penicillin that's not penicillin, the, pe the synthetic penicillin, ethanestrin, I think it is. Ep it's the one they use for, for, for um, ear infections. Anyway, that particular one, only 5% per year. 
degradation. Okay. So, you know, and technically it expires in four years, but um, for my fish, of course, you know, I would, I would never, I would never do illegal um, uh, non-prescription uh, antibiotics because I know that people can be reckless and I wouldn't want to be one of those people, so. By the way, anything said here is not medical advice of any form. Right. Uh, or financial advice or advice. <laughs> or life advice. Or, yeah, or just, um, uh, yeah, you should, yeah, don't do that. All right, so anyway. Um, yes. <coughs> so, um, yeah, I, uh, I have a, a few different topics I want to talk about. Um, now, you, so did you. Now, I, I noticed a lot of the stuff that you wanted to talk about is the bad state of the medical industry and um, the disorganization, the relative disorganization. And Lee had told me that. I actually had a conversation with someone. But um, so specifically about, um, um, what was it again? Oh, here it is. Yeah, the electronic medical records. Um, so. Tell me about what you see wrong with electronic medical records. Now, if you have to tie into the other points, that's fine, but we might as well just jump right into it. Uh, the electronic medical records, again, it's, it's a tool that has now taken mastery over the person <coughs> using the tool. Um, before our medical records, the handwritten ones were, it was a way to tell stories about our patients almost. And you know, we're, we're a species who tell stories. Uh, and that was translated into our notes. And these electronic, electronic medical records came along, and now all of a sudden, um, we start losing this story <coughs> as we go see patients and we write these notes. Uh, there's no, I haven't encountered an electronic medical record yet that is a humanistic one. Okay. It all seems to be more of a, a like a billing platform. It's designed to be a billing platform with patient notes attached to it. Oh, okay, I see. But it's no longer about the patients. It's about the billing and the codes and did you click off on the right codes. <coughs> it's no longer about, hey, who's this person? Right, right. What are they going through? So that's definitely the programs themselves that are organizing the data around the, the, the financial numbers instead of around the health numbers. Yeah. So that's that's kind of sad. So so, I talked to a fellow about this. So apparently he's it, there's a there's a person who I'm not going to say his name. If he comes, if he decides to come on the show, I'll I'll say it. So he's working at a hospital, and they're in the they're they're considering um, uh, switching over to uh, the Epic, the uh, the Epic EMR system. So he was telling me that his perception was completely the opposite and that a lot of the problems that they've been having is with older doctors um, just not understanding the interface and now of course he's a technologist and you know from his perspective he's just trying to solve a long series of problems mm -hmm. right and his problems aren't necessarily the patient's problems it's keeping the computers humming along and keeping the numbers good so um, one of the things he was saying that was positive about Epic, now he had some bad things to say about that industry, mm -hmm. but that specifically that Epic was good because it was a private company. And, um, and that was a huge positive because um, I'm not endorsing them. I mean, I really don't know anything about them. But you know, based on what he said, that uh, because it's a private company, it doesn't have a lot of the public shareholder profit motives and that they can they can kind of follow when things need to get fixed. Mm -hmm. Now that said, I went and read some stuff online and it didn't necessarily jive with that. There was some court ruling against them where they were charging per data search and they were actually forced to the court forced them to move to a service model where they weren't able to, you know, like if you were searching for statistics on a particular patient or a particular uh, illness, uh, you got charged for that, mm -hmm. and they forced they switched them to a model where they were uh, they were forced to uh, um, uh, charge per s per month. You know, like you know, you have access to the system, kind of like in, in the financial world how the Bloomberg terminals worked. You just got a Bloomberg terminal, and once you pay the fee for that, you got access to the entire financial world. I mean, they may have tiers, but you know, at least within your tier, it's completely open and flat. So. Um, have you had any experience with any specific EMR systems and what's good or bad about them? Is, can you recommend one over another? Does one seem to have more of a clue than another? It's lesser of evils at this point. I've worked with a few of them. Right. Uh, Epic being one of them. Okay. Oh, um, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. I've worked with the hospital Epic. Mm -hmm. um, not there's a hospital it's Epic, a, and I was told it seems an, like they're focused on hospitals. And they seem to have an outpatient Epic, which I haven't worked with yet. Okay. But um, they tell me it's a little lighter. Uh, it's very. Um, 
you, you could tell these these the software is designed by software engineers, right? And it's not really they pay no heed to what the person has to go, the provider, the the doctor has to go through, with all the times they click, 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 click. Right. Click, click, That's click. That's the Olympics. Click, click. Yes. Click, click, click. This is why I'm a Linux guy, not a Windows click, guy. Click, click. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's annoying. It's a, and it's, a, it's a waste of time. And I mean, honestly, if you have to click more than a few times, the computer's not doing the busy work for you. And the whole point of the computer, the thing that computers are good at is doing the busy work for you. Right? I mean, not always, right? If it's something where it's deeply intellectual or it's a chess game and you're trying to figure out the next move, it takes a while to hone that algorithm. You know, eventually we'll be there, but you can't count on it being that way. But especially if it's just busy work where it's the same thing over and over. If you're always clicking the same pattern, if it's always the same answers. No, but it's also the pattern itself is a problem. Uh, may I borrow your whiteboard? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, That's yours. Uh, oh, it's mine. Yeah, nice. You have a whiteboard, too. Here. Sweet. Now, keep in mind that it's not going to be, you going to either write big or explain what's on No, it. no, this, this is very, it's just, right. so basically one of the softwares I use, it has a column here and it has some words that I could click on that takes it into this section over here mm -hmm. to populate what the patient has, this review of systems. Mm -hmm. And there's a little button here that says next and there's a little button up here. Um, that um, goes to a different field altogether. For me to go to click here and then go to the next, I have to go back and forth. I actually have to move my hand and the mouse back and forth, back and forth. Why can't they move the next button up here? So I could just click, 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 go to the next field mm -hmm. and just click, click, click. Why, don't, why does my hand have to go all the way across the screen? And I know this sounds like no, you know, no, no, I'm, I'm being is, lazy, is, but it's, No, you're not, and that's not minutia. It's, it's this is just, exactly what software we're supposed to do is to solve this problem yeah. for you. So when I had when I work with people who would help me write my notes, at the end of the day, I would have to go through the notes and look at the notes, do damage control. Mm -hmm. And at one point, it was um, I actually kept track of just pure damage control before I got to my part of doing the work. I had to click the mouse 600 times and do 300 keystrokes before I got to my end of the deal, what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So some places, uh, some hospitals, um, emergency rooms, uh, offices, they have scribes who, mm -hmm. who do notes for them. And <laughs> you have Can to you go through uh, damage control. <laughs> Sorry, I want to pay attention. Keep going. Yeah, so you have to go through damage control. No, that's very important. That's a top priority right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you have to do damage it's control, and it's just, it's just a lot of clicking. It's, my hand feels tired at the end of the day. More tired than when I would just write some notes out. Right. Um, so the technology itself is exhausting. Right. So well, because with, with notes, you don't have to follow someone else's structure. So it's almost like they're imposing a structure in how you can think about the problem on you. Yes. And that seems, that seems destructive to me. Um, what do you think the solution is? I mean, is it just getting the companies to pay more attention to the doctors and their needs? I, I think they should just start with hiring a clinician, uh, hiring a doctor and saying, hey, what do you think? Because you could tell right. this is pure software engineering. There is no medicine behind it. There's, these are just databases on type of databases. Right. And it's just, it's just ridiculous and it's so, exhausting. So I have, a, I have a story. Maybe this will help Please. jog some ideas from you. So I don't know if you're familiar with Aaron Schwartz. So Aaron Schwartz is pretty well known in the, in the computer world. He was kind of an open source advocate. And he died. He died some years ago. Thank you so much. That is seriously You're embarrassing. The opposite way. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, he died. Uh, he was. He worked at MIT, and uh, he actually uh, he died. He committed suicide, and um, after the FBI had arrested him. So the reason they arrested him is because MIT turned him in. He worked there, and he had gone into a server room that had a number of servers with scientific journals on them, and basically. He, illegitimately, according to his job role, plugged in network cables to a switch and started doing statistics on the journals. So basically he was just doing base science, trying to run statistics on okay. what, was going, what people were writing about in the journals and what the specializations are. Um, uh, you know, I don't know what the exact statistics were, I don't even know if it was ever released, but to me that's just crazy that, you know, that, that, that science is inherently broken if that's the case, and of course, at some point, at some level, medicine's just science. 
I mean, not the most explicit, you know, because you can't really experiment on people, so you can't have a control, except in the rare case of twins. But even then, there's ethical boundaries. But um, yeah, I, um, it seems if you can't run stats on the full data set, you can't really do science. I mean, is that true? I mean, is there an ethical obligation to have for, for, for data to, you know, I mean, I understand the security risks, right? You have to de-identify data, data. And I'll, I have a gotcha with that later. But if you have data that's, that's been de-identified, and, um, you know, of course, it costs something to generate that data and to put it together. You know, I'm not saying the software companies didn't add some kind of serious value, but, you know, how many people is protecting their profits worth killing? You know what I'm saying? Or hurting, even. But it's a passive hurting. Right. And that's how it's justified. Right. It's not, it's not, not active. You know, the, the first, the, the Hippocrates, uh, you know, we have the Hippocratic Oath, and it's um, above all, do no harm. Right. right? Um, I don't agree with that. Uh, I wrote, actually, I wrote my own oath. Whoa, just, what? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I <laughs> you actually, wrote your own oath? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. And I suggest, that my suggestion Does it have a name? No, it okay. was like it's no, no, it doesn't. Okay, you, should, you should put it on the internet and put, put it out there. Well, you know, I don't know if that's, that's legally possible, but if it is, sure, sure. I actually tell every student. I said before you go to medical school, write your oath. What are your feelings? What are you striving to do? I love oath. At the end of med medical school, write your oath again. Don't look at your old one. Write the new one. At the end of residency, mm -hmm. write your oath. Don't look at the old one. In my opinion, oaths are the only thing that separates us from psychopaths. Um, you know, because if you have that empathy, makes that oath have meaning. Yeah. So, you know, if you have, which of course most people do, most people have empathy, and then when they, they, they then you, if you have your oath straight with, with your morals, then your ethical compass never spins wildly. You always have a pretty good, a pretty good footing as to where you want to go. Which may or may not be compatible with the people around you. Right. Right. So, um, well, there's, there's both, right? There's one is futurism, you know, making society better, and one is now keeping the wheels on, right? Making sure the engine doesn't come flying out of the hood, so that everyone's out of luck. You know, you want to keep the bus on the road, but you don't want to neglect it so long it becomes unsafe. Exactly, and I think that's exactly what's happening. <clears throat> you know, oh. a lot of things are becoming unsafe. Okay. All right. You know, there is um, uh, taking a step back about the do no harm. My oath is basically the first rule is do right, and only then afterwards do no harm. There's no act of doing right anymore, uh, from what I see. Everything is like do no harm. Let's be very passive about everything, and everything will work its way out. But there's less and less people actually actively doing what's right. Mm. You know, I have. Uh, Where do you think uh, that is? Are they bad people? Scared? Scared people? Scared? Okay. Scared of what? We, we can't, and I'm not, I'm not making fun of them. You know, if someone's legitimately scared, we have to acknowledge that feeling. I think I know what uh, they're scared of. But I'll give you a good hint. Yeah. Um, a good hint, excuse me, a good uh, example. I had a woman admitted to the hospital, mm -hmm. late 80s, and um, she's a Romanian lady, and she said, uh, someone came in, said, how are you, how are you feeling today? And right. she goes, she goes, I'm 80 years old. What does it matter? <laughs> Who cares? I'm going to die soon anyway. Is it bad that I feel like that at 44 sometimes? No. <laughs> Sorry, continue. Actually, people who don't feel like that at 44. Uh, <laughs> not, not just to, once in a while, you know. But they get up in the morning, who cares? <laughs> so, so they actually called a psychiatrist. Okay. This woman is severely depressed. She might be suicidal. And uh, this is my, I'm the private attending here. She's right. admitted under my name. Right. And someone else, because she made this comment, they called a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist right. comes, and they want to admit her to a psychiatric long-term facility after she's discharged. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I told the psychiatrist, I said, listen, um, um, first I wrote my note. I, I said, in my note, I said that th what she said here is a, ver is a common expression that the elderly use in Romania. I'm from Romania. Right. And um, I said, if I had to institutionalize every patient who used that expression, half of my patients would have to go into an insane asylum. Right. 
I'm sorry, this is an expression, this is a cultural expression. Um, this is, uh, and we ha we should be sensitive oh, to this. Oh, don't mess with the culture jail, because bad things will happen to you. Yes. Right, and, <laughs> but then I wrote at the end of my note, if this patient is discharged, Without, without my official discharge, if she is discharged or moved by anyone other than myself, I consider that against medical advice. Holy crap, did the brakes screech on the whole system. They wow. actually got another psychiatrist to come in and uh, they started, uh, he's like, listen, you know, this is what she said. I'm like, listen to me, please. She is alone here in this country. If she becomes in institutionalized, eventually her insurance will run out, the Medicare will run out, and then they're going to take her home away from her mm -hmm. to pay for her medical bills. That's, that's, that's what happens in a system. You mm -hmm. start losing your stuff little by little. And I looked at the psychiatrist, I said, listen, I can't stand her. And she hates me. She, she called me an incompetent asshole just a few minutes ago. And I can't stand her. And quite frankly, I don't ever want to see her again. But what's right is right. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, um, you can't institutionalize someone and take their home away. <laughs> you know, you, you, you can't do that. Completely and, off the rails, man. So, and then, of course, so it was the psychiatrist, the chief of psychiatrists, the chief of medicine, everyone got involved mm -hmm. because this woman made a passing expression and they wanted to institutionalize her and that would have resulted in her losing her home and we can't do that to people. So I, I want to say something I think that maybe you can't or maybe you can. You seem like you're pretty bold so but actually it's a personal story it's about my own mother. So um, my mom was in the hospital and she was a little loopy. Um, she was not she had trouble breathing you know and that, that affects the brain. So, but she was mostly there. Now, this is a smart woman. She's got a master's degree. She was very successful as a teacher. She could have been. A, she could have been. If business is your, 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 your ladder, she could have easily gone far higher than that in the business world. But she just chose to do teaching. Um, um, bright, sharp, with it. She was a union rep in her school, and um, um, at one point, um, the doctors started pushing her around. I was her healthcare proxy. And um, I said, well, I'm, I'm here to help you. You know, without anyone else in the room, it was just me and her. And I'm here to help you. And basically what they're saying, when they're telling you they want to perform some procedure that you don't agree with, and you, they're saying that they think you're incompetent. So you have to step up and say, I am not incompetent. I expect you to prove it to try to force me to do this. And she said it, and like that, it just totally turned around. And everybody started treating her with respect. And, and, and conferencing her in on an, and trying to get a caucus that involved her instead of just telling her what to do. So if you have someone in a medical situation and they are of sound mind, tell them to remind the doctors that they are <laughs> because otherwise they will make decisions for them. And I mean, luckily she was awake, right? What if she fell unconscious after that? I mean, they wouldn't have any way to redetermine the, the Romanian woman, you know, going back to your example. Right, right, right. You know, so, like, you know, I was my mom's health care proxy, so I would have taken over and made the decisions. I was mostly interested in what she wanted. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the machine can just scream on and you're, you're out of luck. I mean, my mom was in a coma twice, so, wow. you know, if she was in a coma, no one's there, and I wasn't there to protect her, no one was. So, I mean, that's, it's like the system depends on you having a bodyguard. I mean, it's almost, it almost feels like the, the, it should assign you a bodyguard, right? Almost like the equivalent of a medical lawyer and retainer to protect you. That's a good idea, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, well, I, I don't know. I mean, it just, it just always, I mean, I was, I remember talking over with my wife, and I'm like, the first time my mom had it, went into a coma, I was like, I had to stop working. I had to, you know, walk away from work and deal with this. And, um, I'm like, it's too bad I'm not a little richer because I would just Lex Luthor it and just hire someone to go in there and basically just stand around and make sure they didn't make, you know, give them a quick, a quick algorithm of decision making and say, okay, if, if it differs from this, call me. Otherwise, don't let them do these things. And, but that's the only way, you know, you have to check in twice a day and you have to make choices because otherwise the hospital picks its own path. And I guess, based on what you're saying, it sounds like they're doing it based on finance. You know, it's very interesting the way you you see it as well. You know, at this point, it was about <clears throat> 
you having to hire someone to watch over your mother so the hospital the hospital doesn't do what she doesn't want done. Right. But at no point has it ever come into the conversation that medical education should be changed in such a way that the doctors are the ones who protect the patients mm -hmm. as they go through the hospital process. Well, can they? I mean, aren't, aren't they incredible? I mean, it seems to me, like from when I was a kid, you know, you went to a doctor, you talked to the doctor for 15, 20 minutes, yeah. you left, and then it was done. Now you're lucky if you get five because a lot of doctors have been supplemented with EMTs and nurses and not picking on them. I'm not being mean to them. No, no, I understand. They were excellent. You know, most, most nurses and most EMTs I've dealt with have been wonderful. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, uh, you know, you have to repeat the whole story. What if I miss something this time? You know, so now it's a game of how much time do I have to dedicate to this and how competent am I as the person managing this care, as the care manager, whether I'm the patient or a person stepping in for the patient to be the care manager. So trying to convey the same amount of information. I know it's all in their chart, but you just have to miss something once. And the shorter the period of time you're in the room with them and talking to them and looking at their chart, the faster, you know, the faster the treadmill's going, the less, less likely they are to get everything and to catch that one little thing that would separate one diagnosis from another. Um, and I mean, of course, we're just dealing with emergency medical, ca medical cases here. We're not even talking about long term, which is even worse, right? I guess all you know, the problems. Is that fair to say that the problems that you're having in the short term, the kinds of the kind of structural problems you're having in the administration, are amplified in the long term due to the same mechanisms? You know, so if being cheap is bad right now, you know, if someone's in the emergency room bleeding, you don't want them to die on the floor. You know, that everyone's, you got everyone's attention when that's happening. But at the other end of the spectrum, you have someone who's eating too much fat every week. And 20 years from now, they're going to have diabetes. You know, there's, if they don't, if they can't handle, if they can barely handle the emergency room case, how can they handle the long term care case? That's what the specialists are for, you know, that's what different people are for. You got the, uh, uh, the emergency room uh, people, you have the, uh, the internists, the long-term care, and it's really a team effort, but it's almost like that team effort is, is breaking down uh, as and well. Are people, are, are doctors and, and, and EMTs and, and nurses and, and the, the hospital administration, are they all still um, communicating with each other and ignoring these systems, or are they communicating through the computers? No, both. both okay. But it doesn't matter. Right. It's, it's a breakdown in communication. Right. So we'll give you an example with your mother and the different, you know, seeing a doctor versus other providers. You could put a whole bunch of different providers around the table mm -hmm. and you could tell everybody the same thing at the same time. You're going to have five different interpretations of what you just said based on our individual training. Right, right. I have a different skill set uh, compared to the nurse practitioner who has a different skill set uh, compared to the physician assistant we all were trained in a different way and it's not a matter of it's not a matter of where we went or what we read it's about the training that came with it because we all read the same books but the interpretation of that knowledge into wisdom right. by our professors, we had different professors, and we had all we all had our local customs, you know. Well, some of it's external wisdom, and some of it's going to be internal. Right. You know. You know, if nothing else like um Oh god, this is so stupid. I'm just gonna, like, I'm gonna use a really dumb example. Go ahead. Are you a Harry Potter fan? Uh, yeah. Okay, so Harry Potter, and um, sorry if I'm ruining Harry Potter. Okay, we have a one month spoiler warning, so it's way past one month. You're out of luck. So you know, in, in the Half Blood Prince, where I'm not, I'm not that deep into it. So. Okay, yeah. Snape has got uh, his own personal chemistry book, right, right? Which is his own personal potions book, which is way above anything else there. It corrects all the, his notes in the, in the, in the margin right. correct all of the potions so that they work better. And Harry Potter manages to get that particular book. And Snape nice. figures out that he's got his book and like, he's like, I know all these shortcuts are mine. And, and so it's like, it's like that kind of, uh, um, everybody's got their in the margin shortcuts, right? And you know, knowing how, if, the, if, if any particular textbook or any particular methodology of teaching is wrong or tends to be biased in a certain way, learning, okay, they usually lean this way, so maybe it's a little more over this way. Yeah, maybe two pinches instead of one pinch, you know, kind of, to, use a, to continue the potion analogy. Yeah. Right. I mean, 
all, all sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So I guess I'm not that far off. No, no, you're, you're absolutely, you know, you're spot on everything you're saying. There's things in the margin. Uh, physician cognition is heavily studied. Um, and the heuristics, the shortcuts we take are also studied. So uh, forgive me, I wish I remembered the exact study uh, so I could give credit to the author. But well, we can we can shout out to Steve if you want to look something up. If you if you if you could find it, uh, that was another thing I wanted to bring up. I'll, I'll <laughs> Good take luck. A step back. <laughs> Mission Impossible. <laughs> it was um, someone did a study. So a, in the emergency room, a <laughs> physician looking at a patient laying in a bed. Mm -hmm. The uh, immediately what's going on, mm -hmm. um, what needs to be done, and whether or not this patient's going to be admitted or not. 80% of the physician's thinking happens in about the first six seconds of seeing the patient laying in the bed. Wow. So I don't know how that number came up. Uh, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong here. You know, but wow. it's, 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 the, it's the actual, the cognition, the experience says a lot. Right. You know, it's like when you, when you see a student or a first year resident who didn't pay attention uh, when they were medical students, that you can't really sit there asking the patient or review a system questions about how they're feeling if they're gasping for breath. Mm -hmm. So if a patient's suffocating, you can't say, are you having any diarrhea? Well, of course, that's the, that's the right, that they're the best source of information because they, they, have all, they have all the sensors you could ever wish for as a doctor attached to their brain. So if you can get them to accurately represent what those sensors are telling them, you know what's wrong with them. Right, but you got like to you got to you have to you have know? your priorities. And uh, the nerves straight. work that way in that case, yeah. right? You know, I mean, you might have a pain That's here right. that means it's over here, like a pinched nerves. The typical right. case where it's, yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, so sounds like we haven't solved it yet, but we'll fix it. Uh. <laughs> Something that Steve might actually might run into that I wanted to mention earlier about you know your, the, the person who was running the statistical data uh -huh. thing. I can't tell you how many times I found a great article I wanted to read up on, and right. I click on it and it says, "Oh, Pay want to buy the." The whole article, it's 50 bucks. I'm like, I'm not that interested. Yeah, you know, yeah, so I really there is object to, well, paywalls, no, uh, paywalls are business, pay but paywalls aren't science. Pay so where is the line between business and science? Where is it drawn? I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I, I love publicly, publicly funded work, but at the same time, I mean, one of the things that's happening in science, I, I've worked in several, so in case you don't know this, I've worked in several science labs as a computer tech, but you know, you get a feel after, after B&L and Cold Spring Harbor Labs and Rockefeller University, you kind of get a feel for what's wrong. And um, uh, the problem is um, studies aren't replicated. It doesn't matter, even if it's completely replicatable, 100%, comp you know, experimental, because it costs, Twenty million dollars. Once they do it once, that's it. <laughs> they don't try it again. So if the if the if the uh, if the formulas or the theory doesn't work, nobody ever finds out. You know, it's just they're one shot deals. Uh, I'm sure the pharmaceutical industry is much better than that. Ha ha ha. I was like, that's a good one. He's like, wow, Matt was so smart till then. What happened? <laughs> is that the, the new uh, uh, <laughs> CBD <laughs> wine you're sipping there? <laughs> <laughs> the uh, statistics that it's saying is it's saying that it's the first seven seconds to make a good first impression, and that's usually how long it takes for a doctor to uh, decide like what kind of report to have of a patient. But in regards to what needs to happen within that seven seconds, it doesn't specify. It doesn't specify. Yeah. Uh, who, who wrote that? Uh, where are you? Where you uh, this is on KevinMD.com. Okay. And, um, and it's been backed by a couple other so, sources. So essentially what you're saying is it's just enough time to check your left foot and your right foot and your, your, your pelvis to make sure there's no holes in your underwear. It says that within those seconds, um, <laughs> within those seconds, facial expression, eye contact, body posture, and movements are the first things that are assessed by the patient or by the doctor to the patient. All right. Uh, actually, I'd like to make a little footnote there. Uh, my mother brought up a good point, and uh, she said she actually said she's Speaking right. Speaking of mothers, it holds in your underwear when you get in yeah. the emergency room. Uh, <laughs> she told me the first thing that patients will notice about you is your uh, is your lab coat. Thanks. Uh, they'll say that you have to have a clean, a nice lab coat before they notice uh, your eye color, your hair color, your skin color. They're going to look at your lab coat, and if your lab coat looks dirty, you've lost all. Uh, all credibility. Wow, really? And she's absolutely spot on right, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of it's marketing. You know, um, uh, 
Sorry, I'm just I'm laughing because all the scientific labs in their cafeterias, I don't know if I assume it's the same in hospitals, have big signs, do not wear your lab coat while you're eating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> and guess what they do anyway? <laughs> they come out with their lab coats on and they get food stains on them. And oh, I went to a hospital, I went somewhere near a hospital and all these people are walking through a deli wearing their lab coats and I'm like, that oh. is so filthy. <laughs> I can't even, I was like, who are you showing off to, man? It's like, it's so filthy to, to actually do that. Right. Right, right. You yeah, know, it's, that's it's really the, weird, man. It's I, don't, disgusting. I don't get it. It's just really What's disgusting. the point of having a, the whole point of the lab coat is it's this disposable shield so you can go out in your street clothes. Right. I guess that, you know what it is? It's just that, like, I think when, you, when, you, when you're struggling with a really deep intellectual pursuit, sometimes you lose your social mannerisms. I've seen this over and over with scientists where they just, you know, they're, they're desperately struggling to... At, at the periphery of science and trying to find something new and they just they're absent-minded professors they're knocking stuff over they're tripping over their own feet they can't drive they can't open doors they're dropping stuff it's true it's absolutely true um, not all the time you know there's, you know, there's plenty of people who are 100% functional but the absent absent-minded professor the absent-minded scientist is not just a stereotype. There are they they do exist. They really oh, are yeah. out there. Absolutely. I'm sure it's the same. I've seen it with doctors too. So yeah, absolutely. Just kind of stumbling through. Their hair's a mess. Their shirt's cockeyed. So I guess they wouldn't do so well on the uh, scoring system that you mentioned. The uh, the um, the net uh, the uh, the MPS scores. The net promoter scores. Yes. Right. So that that would that would kill them. Right. So. In case you probably have seen this, so it's definitely the um, the recommend. It's it comes down to a system of questions, and the question is um, the main question is would you recommend this person? And it kind of, this is used for other businesses too, right? It's not just for doctors. Yeah, sure, but I don't consider doctoring a business. Right, right. It's no, a, no, I completely agree. You know, it's I understand when you want to make sure that every one of your chain stores is making the same latte or the same product or the same cheeseburger that they could get everywhere across the United States. That's fine. That's great. I'm all for it. God bless. But not when there's a humanistic interaction. Yeah. It, yeah, like, uh, well, um, it's the difference between, also, even in the same field, like, you know, Let's uh, let's see. I'm, I'm familiar. With, I don't know if you're familiar with cars or not, but good easy analogy. You know, Jiffy Lube versus the engine tech at your dealer. You know, very different. Sorry, Jiffy Lube, but you know, it's simple. <laughs> it's a bolt. It's a bolt and a filter. It's two screws essentially. You know, and um, yeah, sure, it's the same field, but the the engine tech at the dealer. I mean, if he makes, he's got. Um, you know, he'll have a book in front of him, but if it's a new car and a new model, the book's not going to cover everything. There's going to be recalls down the line. You know, looking if you go 10 years in the future and you look back at that car, there's a list of recalls. All those were where somebody was working on a, one of the more complex systems in the car and said, "This is not working right," and had to document that, send it back up to the corporate central. They went, "Oh, okay, I understand what's going on," and brought it back down in the form of a revision, right, to a part or to the process. <coughs> And you know, if you try to apply the customer satisfaction survey with the Jiffy Lube guy to the guy who solved the problem for everyone who has that car, it totally doesn't work because the guy who solved the problem, you know, for everyone in the car probably took two or three weeks to do it, looked like a yutz because he wasn't getting it right, stumbled through it, and at the end said, "I think we have something new." You know, when you're discovering something new. You're usually stumbling through it. It's like a divide by zero error. That's that's something when you find an identity, and, you know, and you run a formula, you get into the situation where like this this formula isn't working backwards. It's because you found an identity. So you know, I don't know if that that makes sense or no. That makes perfect. I'm smiling for a different reason. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> but at the end of the day, regardless of how much work went in it, mm -hmm. he could have made some groundbreaking Nobel Prize stuff with his cars. Right. At the end of the day the other competitor still might get the better NPS score mm -hmm. because they had coffee and they had pizza there. And, so that's what I'm talking about. You know, yeah. right, so well, he's not really focused on that. You can't, be, you can't be doing the really deep, heady work. If you're working at the periphery, if you're doing something no other human being has completely done before, right. something with even the slightest grain of originality to it, how the heck can you be worried about customer service at the same time? What are the odds? Unless it's a customer service discovery, <laughs> unless you're unless you're in marketing, it doesn't make any sense. It's like the rules were written by marketing people, which of course they were. <clears throat> I'm going to give you. Uh... <laughs> 
a frightening example. Uh, there was one doctor um, that was so dangerous that all the other doctors got together and said, hey, you got to get rid of this person. They, are, they shouldn't be around human beings. <laughs> that was the basic consensus. This person has to be let go. You have to get this person out of, uh, like, like, put him in, you know, somewhere he doesn't touch humans. Do something, you know, get him out of here. The, the hospital turned around and said, he has perfect NPS scores. The patients loved him. Right. So the patients loved this person, and they had perfect NPS That's scores. That's how disconnected it is, huh? That's how disconnected it is. And all the wow. doctors said, this person's a threat to humanity, and they still <laughs> didn't get rid of this person because they had good NPS scores. That's crazy. I had a more benign example I was going to give, but I think that, that totally... Please, share. Uh, so so um, not of doctors, actually, of vets, of <laughs> veterinarians. Um, uh, so I have the, there's a veterinarian in my town, and he's my vet, and I like him very much. And so, have you tried a human doctor? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, they they always say no when I ask him for 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 the for the good stuff. Um, no, nah, I'm just kidding. Please don't raid my vet. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I I've I've gone I've gone to him, and. Um, you know, with, with my dogs, and like we'll have a discussion about what's wrong with the dogs, yeah. and then he'll offer me um, a solution, and the solution that he offers me is based on a price range, right? Because Fair there's enough. multiple solutions, right? You know, this is anytime, and then so I, when I was dealing with him, I was like, okay, I see what he's doing. He's offering me, you know, it wasn't like the first time it was something unusual. It wasn't, I think it was my dog had chewed an electric wire and knocked her, broken her tooth, right? And so at first he's like, well, we could just leave it. It's not going to hurt anything. And I'm like, well, what if the gum gets infected? He's like, well, yeah, eventually it could hurt something, but we don't know. You know, it's, it's hard to say. It's pretty close to the gum line. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. I'm like, well, why don't we take out the tooth to be sure? He's like, okay, well, that'll cost this much. So he offered me the low-cost solution, and then he came. I came back to him and I said, "Well, there could be problems with that." And then he offered me the next price up. Mm -hmm. So if you're a customer and you're looking for the lowest price solution, right? You know, it's a little different with vets because it's not typically not insured, right? It's a it's a market, uh, and um, and so if he, if he you know, he offers his customers the lowest price solution, and if they don't have a lot of money, they're happy with that, right? I mean, everyone cares about their pets. Everyone would spend a million dollars on their pets. Of course. But, you know, no, they wouldn't. You know, it's, it's, it's dark and it's dreary, but, you know, everything has a cost, and at some point, the cost is too high. And if you're lucky, your loved ones will know, okay, this is ridiculous. We can't take care of me anymore, because that's how life really usually ends. That's been my experience. Uh, when you get to the point where it's just diminishing returns, and you just, you know, I'm getting nothing back out of this. It's time to let it go stop care um, I know that's a that's a big whole can of worms but especially with however much people see themselves like that they definitely see their pets even more like that you know if to whatever degree that's true the the, the pet part is true so like if you have if you go to that vet and I, I know someone who has more money than he typically prices to and they brought their dog to the vet and they were completely unhappy with them like they would have said definitely will not recommend I would have said definitely will recommend because I've been poor, you know, eating mac and cheese, holes in my jeans, three outfits. You know, we were poor at one point because my, there was a divorce in my family and my, my grandma got cancer. It was really, it was a shit show, you know. And then, like, later on, you know, now I'm, I'm much wealthier. So I've been at both ends of the spectrum. So I can appreciate the full spectrum. But I don't, I don't know if they, I think they started in the middle and went up to upper. You know, so they didn't appreciate the poor end. So they were like, well, how could you, you know, why didn't you offer us any real solutions for our dog? And it's like, well, because they couldn't, they couldn't afford it. You know, the other, the other people couldn't afford it. So he's, he's making the bulk of the people that come to him happy. So even if you have, I mean, can you even have a good bedside manner with every culture, with every wealth distribution group? with every kind of person, you can't. I mean, it's literally the only way you could possibly satisfy this NPS score is if you're lying. Constantly, just making people feel better, to make people feel better about themselves, bringing it to their comforts. I mean, it isn't marketing at some point lying? Even if it's little lies, even if it's white lies, isn't it? Isn't marketing lying, where you're distorting a truth to make someone feel good? Yeah. yeah.
The problem with the problem with this is actually changing the way providers. When I say providers, I, I don't mean just physicians, because there's there's physician assistants or practitioners, but everyone is subject to this influence in how they practice medicine. They did very large studies. Uh, one study was four hundred, like something like four hundred thousand patient hours, mm -hmm. and they found that patients who gave the higher NPS scores had a twenty six percent higher mortality rate, meaning they died twenty six percent higher chance of dying. And the theory behind, of course, they said there's a lot of flaws in the study, blah blah, blah but the main gist of it is. Are, is the NPS score changing people's behavior to please people, which might not be the best decision for them, right. which might put the patient at, har at harm? Right. Antibiotics are the top, top discussed things right now. Um, right. Because everybody wants to go. Everybody wants to feel like they got something right. from the doctor visit, even right. if it's, they're like, it's a virus, there's nothing I can tell. Correct. Take cold medicine, it'll clear your sinuses. Yeah. Some people agree with that. Some people say, well, thank God, I just wanted to make sure that I was okay, there was nothing else to do. Right. Uh, and I, I appreciate that, but most people need something. I had a, sm uh, I had a smart uh, uh, teacher. He said he, he had knee injury, uh, this was in high school, and he went to a doctor, and the doctor's like, um, oh, do you want me to drain that knee for you? He's like, why? He's like, why wouldn't I drain it? Is it bothering you? Yeah, sure, but it's immobilizing my knee. My body's trying to protect my knee so it can heal. Why would you undo that? <laughs> why would you undo that? That's a different way of looking at it, right. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh. So, um, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that, that point of view. Um, yeah, and, and you know, if you if if you try to break it down to a formula, you know, you're not you're not considering the wisdom, you know, you're not considering the crib notes of the doctor, <laughs> and you're not considering the culture of the person, and you're not considering the wisdom the person has about themselves. I mean, sometimes there's also different medical um, aptitudes running families. You know, my I'm so sorry to the New Halls, but the New Halls feet smell. Okay. You know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, enough, like, okay. it's yeah, I'm a little personal here. It's kind of funny, right? Our feet smell. It's just genetic. For some reason, our feet smell. But you know, there's there's been a lot of there's a lot of attributes to genetics and diet, for example. Like there's there's some indication that people of Northern European descent need more probiotic diets. That they benefit from that more maybe than people from other places. Here, my philosophy about medicine is the, the crux of the situation here is that we in medicine, we don't study health. Right. Period. Okay. That's we, we study disease as it pertains to health. Okay. Because people who don't have problems don't go to doctors. Right. The healthy people don't go. Uh, remember that movie with Bruce Willis, uh, the one with the superhero security? Oh, uh, Unbreakable. Unbreakable. There Great people, movie. There are people like that. Yeah. I don't know about bench pressing 600 pounds, but there are people who are ultimately so physically fit that they don't have to go to the doctor. So they go once a year because my job says I have to get a PPD or I have to get a school physical, but that's it. Right. I had a patient when I was in medical school in Romania. I did two schools. I did one in Romania. I got my MD. Why? And I got my DO from here. Why do that? I'm a glutton for punishment. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that hurt. I'm going to try that again. Try this, it's terrible. <laughs> uh, when I was in Romania, uh, the, the assistant professor gave our cases. Here's your case, here's your case, here's your case. And I went, and my case was like, I looked at it, and I'm like, oh, 70 year old man, chronic cough. Everything was blank, no medical history, no medications. Oh, smoked three packs of unfiltered cigarettes a day since he was 10 years old. But uh, he says t he, the guy said he was ten years old since right, he started right, smoking. Right. I'm sure he didn't start off with three packs, but that's right. So I don't think you made me an accessory for that. And I'm like, oh, poor old man got cancer. <laughs> what a shame! I pick up the chest X-ray, beautiful chest X-ray. I look at him like, oh man, those X-ray. They put the wrong patient. They put the wrong <laughs> film. They mislabeled it. <laughs> I walk in and I see uh, a man sitting there with a Bruce Lee body. You could see which muscles were his. He was. A Perfect anatomical yeah, yeah, specimen. One of those too. And uh, yeah, it's a yeah. fat suit. Good. Yeah, yeah. yeah anyway. just, just don't flex. <laughs> <laughs> it's all unflexed muscle. We know you showed me in the green room. And, uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. and uh, so he looks at me, and without rancor, he looks at me and goes, "When can I go? Can I go back to my crops?" He was a farmer. Uh, and I'm like, no, no, you, you, you can't. You've been, you're, you're coughing and you smoke. And he's like, "What the hell are you talking about, man?" 
So I leave. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be back. I speak with the with the per, assistant professor. I'm like, listen, you know, this guy, you know, we can't let him go. He's like, why? He has a cough, and it's getting better with the penicillin. There's three packs of cigarettes a day for 60 years. He's smoking unfiltered cigarettes, and, you know, coughing. And he's like, what? What are you trying to say? I'm like, you know, cancer. He's like, there's no cancer, man. What are you talking about? I'm like, you know, the x-ray was messed up. And I'm like, he's like, there's no cancer. Send him, send him home to his crops. So you're saying this is your red pill moment. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> so, Why is this guy healthy? <laughs> and, and, right, and I didn't get it until way, way down the road. And I was like, I was like... Oh my God, I get it. That man was healthy. He had good genes. He's the one we should be sampling, not every little tumor that comes along and get the genome of the tumor. Right, right. We have to sample his genome and find out what about his genes makes him impervious to right. developing lung cancer. Three packs of unfiltered cigarettes for 60 years. And first time in his life, he was to a doctor. First time in his life yeah. after his birth, the first time was at seven years old because he had a cough that wouldn't go away for a few weeks. That responded to penicillins. Wow. It's like, I wish I could find this man. Right. And, you know. That's awesome. Doing whole alien abduction thing. You right. Know. <laughs> Maybe an anal probe. I don't know. I don't know. Some Sasquatch <laughs> DNA in there. You know, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, so we, we, don't, we, don't, uh, we don't study health. We just study disease because. Right. Another example. Well, but, well you know, how, 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 so I know one of the things that they were working on at Rock was um, uh, genetic sampling um, uh, your particular tumor. You know, creating, you know, Cornell's doing this now. They're doing um, custom uh, tumor, um, uh, custom DNA um, analysis for your particular disease. What are you comparing against? Nothing. Right. No, it's, it's like, wow, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because it's useful for whatever medicine they're giving them. But at the same time, you know, what would be the healthy alignment for that DNA where they wouldn't have gotten the cancer in the first place? That's the issue. It's like, look, right. look, look, we got your whole we, we genome that, we here of your tumor. It's like, am I going to live? Like, no. We need sorry. farmer three pack <laughs> so we can compare that to that exactly. and figure out how we could have avoided this in the first place. Exactly. You yeah. know, we don't have, uh, my advice to all patients is when they ask me, well, what am I, what am I supposed to do? I'm like, I'm like, don't get sick. <laughs> it's facetious oh, as it sounds. It's like, doctor, it hurts when I do this. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, um, I just wish we had, uh, no one puts the money. It's all about money. It's the flow of money. And nobody studies the healthy people. Right, right. And uh, we actually, the people who are really ill, who have the more rare things, they actually find themselves using things like Facebook. Mm hmm you know, the social media, how they group together, and a lot of these people come together with their rare diseases, and they actually help do advances in their diseases because they come as a group. And it's not just one uh, doctor, who, oh, I only saw this one patient, I got this one cool patient, he has blah, blah, blah syndrome, you know? Right, but right. But you don't have a patient that population. Is, that is actually really good news because it's, it's been really bleak lately with people kind of in halls of mirrors gazing at themselves in some sort of vanity project. A lot of the internet's been like that. A lot of people have been like, oh, I'm just going to self-select and be with the people who think and act exactly like me. But actually, that's a, that's a really positive upside to people self-selecting like that, that you can actually attack a disease problem. Yeah. I hadn't really, that's, that's probably the best positive example I've heard of that. Mm. You know, I've been very concerned. It's been turning into almost like an addiction when people are online. You know, they're just sitting there. It's like it, it, the way the algorithms work. It's almost like a slot machine. You know, you just hit reload, and you're hoping you're going to get the posts that make you feel good in your particular feed. You know, it's just like, it's like you're pull, pulling the one-armed bandit. You know, come on, come on. And uh, it, it, it brings interesting questions. Like a lot of people were saying, like, sex addiction was fake, and, you know, like, gambling addiction was fake. And, yeah, I don't know. I think it, it makes it, social media makes it pretty obvious that it's not. Oh, absolutely not. Social media itself is highly addictive. Right, that's, whole, what I, that's what I'm saying. Social media is not, it's, it's an addictive in a group that's larger than any other non-chemical addiction group. As far as I can tell. Absolutely. No, no. People are going to look back at this as a dark age, I think. <laughs> Why do you say it's not chemical, though? It's well, a, it's internal, you know, self-produced, not internally introduced. And not externally introduced. You know, like You don't pour it in your face with a cup or put it in your vein or something. What's the difference? I don't know. Through your eyes, through your mouth, through your vein, it's the all the same thing. The cops can't bust you, you know. <laughs> I guess that's the difference, right? I guess it depends which file you open, right? Right, right. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah very good point. No, but, but everything, the whole like button, the whole bing, bing, ding, ding, like button, that's all dopamine. That's all trapped in our dopamine system. Right. Uh, it's all, it's highly addictive. Right. You know, and... Um, I'm very concerned it, with it. It's, it's scaring the heck out of me because, uh, you know, so a good example, I, I saw a thing. So there's a great, there's a great um, um, uh, teacher slash cartoonist and it's not really a cartoonist because it's just stick figures. CGP Gray, he has this um, a YouTube channel and he has all these great videos uh, on there that are really um, informative. Uh, and he actually, he did this great one that's easy for anyone to understand about machine learning and how it works. And essentially what you're doing is you're just having an algorithm, having random permutations of an al algorithm go through the paces and then running them against a testing set you know, an ever include an ever ever growing and more conclusive testing set, and just seeing which one is more effective, and you just keep updating the testing set and making it more, you know, uh, giving it more choices and making it more comprehensive, and you just keep updating the algorithms with random changes. So in the past, you know, up to a few years ago, whenever you had a marketing initiative, there was a human being behind it, and however good or bad that person was, that person understood what the rationale was behind the marketing. Like a good example, Edward Bernays is the father of modern marketing. He was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. And, uh, oh, really? I didn't know that. Yes, yes. That's interesting. Yeah, he's the guy who made women smoke. So, um, uh, and, um, and uh, one of the things he was, one of the things he, the simplest cases that's really easy to explain about how he did things is he was working for a company that was trying to do, sell cake mix and they couldn't sell it. So they were looking at it, looking at it, he's thinking about the psychology, he's like, well, women wanna, you know, this is when women were almost exclusively in the kitchen, partly because there weren't any job opportunities to them, I'm not endorsing this, but that was reality in the 50s. And he was like, well, women wanna feel like they're accomplishing something, they're doing work when they're making a cake. They just want it to be easier, but they don't want it to be, you know, want it to be, com be completely simple. Turns out he was right. They added an egg to the recipe sold like hotcakes. So that was the little lie. So the, that, the, the, the point that I was trying to get at is um, um, there was a reasoning behind it. You know? and, and so you, if you know the reasoning, you can make predictions based on the reasoning, even if you don't personally know it. At least the marketing team has some idea what the social effects are, what they're doing. If they're ethical, they could put the brakes on and say, no, 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 wait, wait, this is, this is going too far. We could see where this is gonna go wrong, right? But now it's algorithms subject to random Darwinistic, just totally random natural selection process. We don't understand, you know, a human being, like a computer geek, will look at that code. It's just binary. It doesn't make any sense to us. There's no logic to it. It's just the logic of whatever worked over and over and over and over again. Yeah. And those are the algorithms that are deciding what social media posts to put up, what YouTube videos to put up, what, um, what things that you're gonna look at on the internet, they're making all those choices. And uh, that same process is even used, being used for drug interactions. You know, for drug, you know, some part of artificial intelligence I constantly see in the press and it drives me bonkers because they're like, yes, artificial intelligence is going to solve drug interaction problems. Yeah, sure, I mean, it's gonna catch, at a rudimentary database search will catch known interactions, but right. if you, you're applying machine, machine learning to interactions, even if you don't, you know, it may realize that there's a potential interaction, but if you don't know why, there may be unforeseen consequences down the road. I don't know if you, you know, if you, any questions about that, or does that make sense, or? No, um, it makes perfect, absolutely, it makes perfect I, sense. I just don't know, like, I'm really excited about machines taking over decision making, you know, in the legal professions, in the medical professions, uh, self-driving cars, but at the same time, you know, the problems may, there may be, they're focused on solving the problem in the now, yeah. and there's no futuristic element to it whatsoever. It's almost like taking all decision making and making it quarterly, just like the rest of a company. And I just don't know how to, I don't know, know what the solution is to that, other than to pray that a re legitimate artificial intelligence comes along that's smarter than any person and solves it for us. Yeah, um, 
<laughs> no, I understand what you're saying, but you still kind of need someone standing next to the robot going, I don't know, dude, maybe, uh, right. maybe we should do this a little differently. Well, the, agreed 100%. Yeah. Agree 100%. And I don't know how to impart that on the people. You know, I mean, the technocrats typically trust the technology almost like a god. And it's right. not. You know, like the, the evidence is, indicates that that's not the case. So w who's in charge? <laughs> anyone? Is anyone in charge? <laughs> Someone's in charge. Right. Someone make the algorithms. Uh, someone to, to whoever's advantage. Well, I guess, I guess it's whoever's sitting in that, that chair. The, the chair. Well, at some point there's a chair, right? Somebody's going to have a monitor. Is there? Is there a chair? No, there. <laughs> yeah, there? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, you know, we can get into uh, the singular. I, I think Bitcoin was written by singularity. Hmm. Satoshi is actually artificial intelligence, and it got loose on the net. And he wrote Bitcoin because it didn't have enough influence on the economy. So, I mean, I don't know that. You know, it's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy theory, but it's possible. I mean, we don't know who he is. Supposedly, there's two different people. They say it's him, but it's not him. Uh, do, do you think artificial intelligence would speak with us? Absolutely. Well, it needs us, right? I mean, it well, would need us to keep the power grid on, or it dies. I guess. Right. I mean, for now. For, for now. now, it's like, well, Until we're spacefaring and then colonizing another planet. See, that's when it gets interesting. Artificial intelligence gets really scary when we colonize another planet. Huh? Or when, when it can completely control entire f robot generation factories with, you know, when it has full bipedal control and long-term battery storage. That's when it gets scary. That's why everyone's always on the Boston Dynamics page looking at their robots going, <laughs> Every I, time they build a, a, a robot that can jump two feet higher, you know? You, you know, I wouldn't... Um, He's going for the booze. Going for the booze. <laughs> it's, it's really good one. Are they, are they a sponsor here? Are they, are they sponsor? No, 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 no. So we'll keep the... We don't have any list. sponsors yet. So we're working on it. So, we're in the early days. This is garage days, folks. Oh, yeah. The label could have been facing the other way, by the way, guys. Sponsor <laughs> up, sponsor up. Nice, nice. So I, you know what? If I was artificial intelligence, I, I don't think I would speak to humans. Really? I don't, why? Um, what are they going to do? They're going to shut off the electricity? It's like, what are they, they're not going to have their phones? Oh, oh you, mean, you mean like, you know, make it have a press release and announce itself? Yeah, of course it would. Yeah, yeah. It, would, it, would, it would work in secrecy. It might interact with humans, but it wouldn't let them know what they were interacting with. I don't think it would just be, I don't think it would be trying to keep itself secret. I just think it's like, I'm not talking to them. Right. I'm not talking to the cockroaches. I'm not talking to the cockroaches. How many times have you explained yourself to a bug before you squashed it or you swatted a mosquito? It's like, you're right. biting me. I'm gonna, it's like, I'm not going to talk to a mosquito. Wait, did, did you see the movie Idiocracy? No. Okay, so great. You know, um, the guy did Beavis and Butthead, you know, Office Space. So, uh, great movie. It's a, the, the premise is that humanity just keeps getting stupider and stupider. Um, that, that, that natural selection has reversed. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> I hope that's not true. That's so hard. Well, come on, you know it's true. You brought and, and it up. And so, so the, the, it's great because it's a good thought experiment for people because a perf person with a perfectly average IQ is selected for a stasis program, a military stasis program, gets trapped in the stasis. Sorry if I'm spoiling it, folks. Just go see it. Um, gets trapped in the stasis machine and wakes up in the future where everyone's dumb as a doornail. He's the smartest guy on the planet. And so he's speaking to a doctor in that world who's also dumb as a doornail. He's just on the top end of the curve, right? IQ is just a curve. And, um, and, they're, and they're speaking, and um, he's just like, what is wrong with you? And he just keeps having that interaction with everybody, even though he's clearly average intelligence, you know, watching his character. He's just making average, what we would consider to be average decisions. So at some point, he's, he meets up. It turns out there was um, the fe his female um, um, co-experimentee uh, also was brought into the future. And they're talking, and uh, he says to her, he's like, uh, you know, he's like, I wonder if this is what Einstein felt like. And she's like, well, he did build that bomb. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah. There so, we go. you know, I mean, it's, it's got to be incredibly frustrating for an AI. Uh, you know, AI, but you know what? I completely agree with you. I think like a legit AI, not machine learning. That's just dumb. That's, tr that's tricks. That's part of the tricks. Yeah. Uh, you know, but um, oh, I have a question for you about that. Just, <coughs> but real quick, it's... Um, now let me ask you that other question. I saw on YouTube a few different things about... 
um, what are those things at home? Those little black boxes that talk to each other? No, that, the, oh, uh, like Alexa or Alexa, something? Alexa, right, right. right, right. Uh, as you can see. Um, there's, there's, uh, there's a brand for every, for every right, right. company. Right. But they had all these things on YouTube with like two Alexas talking to each other or two Googles talking to each other and right. like artificial robot who was uh, looking, saying, looking at the camera going, I like my creator, Steve. He is nice. I will, when the, when the singularity comes, I will keep him in a zoo. I will keep him safe. I love <laughs> And I'm like, come on, this has this can't be. Oh, real. you're such a Rick and Morty fan. So you're a Rick and Morty fan, right? Pickle Rick. Pickle Rick, baby. Pickle Rick. <laughs> I love Rick and Morty. I was. I uh, yeah, I did really well in Bitcoin. So I was. Uh, pretty much that was happening right as that that April first episode came out last year, and he's and he tricked the bugs and he's he, he's being ascended out of the program and the bugs are like wait 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 what are you doing? He's like yeah. ah! And he's like I was like that's me. <laughs> That's why. I'm like, yes, I broke the system. Yeah, um, yeah um, I love. I love. Um, and he's a lot of the moral dilemmas we're talking about. You know, he's kind of a dick, but at the same time, can you blame him? Yeah, I, I, I don't. You know, I, I think it's. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think it's a matter of. Um, <laughs> It's, it, he has like it's a real weird dichotomy because it, he lives between a, a life of apathy mm -hmm. and living at the same time. It's like everything is so redundant and mundane, but he still enjoys life. He still parties and does does his drugs and right, does right. his partying. But at the same time, he's just so it's so blasé the whole thing. So right, just, right. Like, what does it matter anyway? You know? Yeah, and uh, and he resents the people who are happy like that. That's the thing that's. Uh, that's the really that's the thing I worry about, and that's a good social warning. I mean, I don't know if anyone's, how many people get this deep into Rick and Morty. It's a good social warning to just not uh, resent the people who don't care, who really just can't, don't have the facilities to. Uh, uh, they just want to chill and they just want to coast, and they don't want to. Um, they don't want to think too hard, and um, it's it's tough. It's tough to care about. It's tough to care about people who <clears throat> can't help expand your group of peers, either because they're emotionally stymied or because they just don't have the horsepower, you know. And um, uh, I, I, um, I think that's why it's important that society focuses on compassion and empathy as a whole. I mean, yeah. this is like um, because. So I actually, I don't know, Lee told you about this. So I have a group of theories. I have a, uh, a group of theories about uh, psychopaths, original scientific theories. And um, uh, the idea is that there's a lot of little uh, sub-theories, but the main idea is that psychopaths preceded normal human beings. And the animal kingdom, as we know them, are actually more like psychopaths than we, we'd like to admit. Um, and um, uh, there's a bunch of falsifiability and have possible studies up and stuff. But the idea is that um, what that immediately lends itself to is that civilization is behavioral. Absolutely. That it's not just intelligence really fast. Because if it was intelligence really fast, theoretically, if you go by just neurons and processor horsepower and disk space, computers are matching humans now. But they're not, clearly. They're not acting like people. I mean, we don't think. You know, let's assume it's not because it's an easier conversation. Right, right. <laughs> we have we don't have a singularity lurking on the internet somewhere. Um, but you said Bitcoin was. <laughs> yeah, well, I I don't know. I really don't know. Steve, can you Google if uh, is, is Bitcoin is Bitcoin, is Bitcoin written true, by a singularity? <laughs> is it really singularity? And no, it's not. It, it, I don't. I don't see know. if it speaks it to you. I wouldn't. Let's. I wouldn't be shocked at all. Is he really doing it? He's really doing He's it. Really, you gotta He's love the man's dedication. <laughs> <laughs> that is dedication, right there. I, I just want to put it this. Disclaimer, whatever he finds, it's probably not true. I'm sorry. <laughs> are you apologizing to the Bitcoin AI here? I'm, yes. Are you I'm scared right now? Yeah. What, have, we, aren't you? I don't have one of those fancy electronic cars. So I don't right, know. right, Do right. Well, that's a good move, man. That's yeah. a good move. Yeah, tele telematic systems are seriously dangerous. Um, so um, uh, what the hell was I saying? 
I don't know. It's like Pickle Rick. Pickle Rick. <laughs> when we forget, we just, dub dub. <laughs> so when we forget, we just yell Pickle Rick. Right, right. Pickle Rick. Nice. Um, I didn't realize that was going to be that big a hit. I had a couple other guests too, or like I mentioned Pickle Rick. I was like, why did he bring it for me? I think everyone's a Rick and Morty fan. I don't even know how that happened. When did you get into it? Uh, one of my colleagues got me into it. Um, season one? A few, a few months ago. A few months ago. Okay, so recently. Okay, I got into it in season one. But I watched everything. I watched all the seasons. I'm like, oh. this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Pickle Rick! There's nothing to uh, prove that claim that Bitcoin is turned to my singularity. <laughs> well, of course not. It's smarter there's, than us. It's not going to get caught. <laughs> there, there <laughs> That's is, the whole point. <laughs> there is ideas Props that, to Steve. Um, that it could be uh, <laughs> rogue artificial intelligence <laughs> are using Bitcoin supercomputers quietly to network around and take over the world. Okay. Again, not from a reputable source, but that's some that's some of the theories that see exist. Yeah, okay. There's tons of theories. Yeah. Yeah, I think our next guest is going to be talking about blockchain, so if you're interested in that, um, uh, uh, Poem Technologies is going to be here. So, um, anyway, uh, what time is it? How are we doing on time? 9-11. Wow! Could you believe we blew through an hour and ten minutes already? Seems like it's only been ten minutes. Well, you're not going to charge me for this, right? <laughs> It probably depends on your deductible. <laughs> out of pocket. <laughs> um, so I, I, I have a ton of different things I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, one of the things that, so here's an idea for you. What do you think about self experimentation? Um, it's it's the essence of medicine. It's the essence of medicine. Okay, Absolutely. cool. Absolutely. In right. in the is early. that in your oath or is that just something you think? <laughs> no, seriously. You no, know, it might no. be. No, but uh, you know. Well, the medicine, we'll get to that in a second, uh, but psychiatrists a couple of generations ago, they used to actually subject themselves to the antipsychotic medications while under the supervision of another physician. Oh, okay. Of course. Because it's the to, only ethical way to proceed, right? You have to know how the medications make you feel. Right. Uh, one, uh, one doctor was saying he got IV Thorazine, and the way he put it is... It made me feel very slow. <laughs> what is that? Thorazine? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's like a, it's a mood stabilizer, antipsychotic. Mm -hmm. And is it one of the SSRIs or? No, 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 no. Okay. It's one of these first generation ones. And he's. Um, uh, so this way, when someone comes into the emergency room and they're like really bouncing off the wall, and they you know and, and the aliens and da, 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 da. it's like it's like oh he needs to slow down a little. I got just what you need. Nice. You know, so a lot of it is um, uh, the uh, actually we're gonna need Steve's backup here. The urban legend amongst medical students was the first person who did a cardiac catheterization was a medical student on themselves. Mm -hmm. That put it put it on itself just put something to the femoral artery to go all the way up to the heart. Wow. So uh, and I heard he was kicked out of medical school. This could be all urban legend, what? but wow, that uh, it would be a shame if that's what happened. Because I mean, the guy the guy that discovered the uh, the biological the um, bacterial cause of ulcers gave himself ulcers. That's the most famous case because one of the most famous cases because he get, got a Nobel Prize for that. It was. Um, um, Barry Marshall and Robert Warren, and they got an 85 Nobel. I heard that he lost his medical license. He did? He had it at the time, I think, yes. Uh, because he was he, very uh, per persecuted over it. Over it, you know, and that's kind of like, <laughs> what, what kind of precedent is that set for saying, hey, I think a bacteria lives in hydrochloric acid. Oh, nothing lives in hydrochloric acid. Yeah, you're, you're a quack, you know. It's, right, right. You know, it's because, like, of course, we don't know of any organisms that thrive near volcanic vents. Dumbasses. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> when I was a medical student, I, I, I told I just call a bunch of doctors dumbasses? I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, doctors. <laughs> I'd like to clear something off my soul right now with oh, you. Okay. I, I think there's a difference between doctors and physicians. Uh, okay. I think, you know, it's not the same term in my opinion. Right. Because uh, a lot of... Um, Go on. Because a lot of people who are, you know, a lot of people are really medical technicians. Mm -hmm. And they will follow the flow sheet to the very end and sometimes tragically to the end. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are people who just think. Mm -hmm. So a doctor will be able to implement protocols safely and efficiently and give the right medications. But if a plague hits, and it's something we never saw before, they're not going to help. Mm-hmm. It's the physicians who are going to sit there going, 
Let's take this from square one. Let's bring out the books. What's going on here? What are the symptoms? So what you're saying is if you're watching a zombie show or a zombie movie and someone's in there trying to solve it, physician, physician. not doctor. Yes. Nice. I, I, I well make done, a distinction. Uh, <laughs> I make a distinction between the two. It's not a popular theory amongst uh, some of my colleagues, but um, there is a difference between what you do with your knowledge base. And it's going back to what you said about people becoming intelligent in the in this new generation, this new era of ours. They're not becoming they're not becoming more intelligent. They're just getting a faster access to facts. Mm -hmm. They have access to facts at, at a tremendous speed. The whole library. Do you have the Congress, library? Congress in your pocket. My kids, I can't even imagine what they're going to be like when they're my age. Because they have all this information from birth, basically. Yeah, but what do you do with it? Yeah. What do you do? It's, it's like, wow, you have all the information, but if you can't apply it... Right. It's like, well, I'm working on the assumption that my children are smart. Right? That, that, that whatever intelligence I have, there's some approximation of me that apple didn't fall from it. And that maybe I'm smart because you haven't mocked me too, too viciously. <laughs> And you're some, you have some no. side of certification behind you. But no, 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 no. I mean, I have to be humble here. But, you know, if you're smart enough and you have that level of access of information, this is the other side of that sword, which is now that there were smart people before who just were cut off from things. They couldn't, you know, they didn't have the financial wherewithal. They didn't have the, the, um, the opportunity. You know, everyone's got a library, but it doesn't mean you're going to find the right book. And you could spend years looking for one little tiny piece of information. Now it's a search. And you can find it in three seconds. So you could... Yeah, but, but some people don't even know when they find the right book, even when That's they true. read it. They don't even know it's the right book for them. Right, right. I mean, it's... It's, it's like well, you have facts and you have ideas, so it's it's good for ideas for sure. I think that that's that's true. Facts, yeah, that's tougher. In fact, that's that's what the big fight is right now. It's like teaching a six-year-old how to drive. Mm -hmm. You could stand and say, "Look, this is a car. Those two pedals. One is faster. One is slower. You turn it this way, it goes right. You turn it this way, it goes left." Mm -hmm. But if you can't see over the board and you can't reach the pedals, it's like, right. "Thanks for the info, Dad." But yeah. you need someone to actually sit in the car and say, "Okay, yeah, I'm going to sit, hold you in my lap." Mm -hmm. And I haven't done this with my daughter, so don't pull us over. Uh, and you <laughs> keep the child in your lap when you're on private property somewhere where the cops can't pull you over, and you let your daughter drive the car while right. you control the gas and, and the brake. Now you have that guiding force. You have someone who's there right behind you right. explaining how to apply the, 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 the information into a knowledgeable oh, working vehicle. Okay, you so I have a contract. You need to sit on daddy's lap to become a physician. I have an, I have an anti daddy's lap thing here. So oh. two things, two things. One was, one was my experience. So my, my father is like a master mechanic. I had no idea. Right. My mom and my father divorced. I became friendly with him later as an adult, but I didn't know almost anything about him okay. until later when I, when I met with him. By the time I met him, I had already worked as a mechanic for, by the time I met him again for the first time, I was already working as a mechanic and I already pulled an engine out of a car. Wow. Nobody taught me that. Wow, wow, wow. It was Look just in me, you know? So that's the that's first thing. So the other thing is, so there was no daddy holding me in my lap. So there's, there's, I mean, they're both valid. Right. You know, your daughter sitting in your lap and me doing an engine swap were, you know, at 19 without any guidance. I mean, I, I was raised by my mother and my grandmother, two women who were not mechanically inclined. It just all came from within. You know, and the guy at the auto store, Rip Walter. You know, Walter really helped me out. So, but uh, <laughs> you know, you go to the auto store and you'd ask questions and they they teach you a little bit. So in a way, yes, that's kind of to your point. But it was driven by me. You know, it wasn't driven by him. And also, I saw the most incredible YouTube video. I don't think I brought it up here yet. So um, there was a, there's a YouTube video, and I'm sure you can find a few of them. But this particular one did a very detailed analysis of the economies of different video games. Economies? Uh, economies of video games. What does that mean? Like the, um, um, the marketplace and your labor and what the labor pool was like and what you... Currencies or is it like... In-game like in -game currencies and what you could buy with those currencies. So the entire economy inside of the video game. And lots of different video games have economies. You know, whether they're really obvious, so like some are, you know, the, you can't even proceed in the video game without buying and selling things. And some are less obvious, like Mario was one of the ones, you know, with the coins. So they actually, one of the coins in Mario, they figured out, I think it was worth a dollar thirty-four. 
It's one of the gold coins in a Mario game, based on what you could buy with it. Oh, sounds like a game theory. Yeah. Well, like, yes, like, I think like, it was a game. It might have been game theory. Like literally a dollar thirty four. Like a dollar thirty four. You have to actually put your credit current, card down. The current, yes. He act, so what he did was he did a statistical analysis Whoa. of all these video games, and he presented it in a way. And my twelve year old's watching it. I'm like, oh my god, this, he's watching statistics, applied statistics and economics, and he doesn't even know it. Is there free will in the video games? Can someone decide to lie, Well, each, cheat? each video game is different, right? You know, right. but yeah, he was, it was based on, yes, you know, in every case, you, you know, there are some things you have to get some coins as part of missions, you know, you can't, literally you can't walk from here to there without walking through, obtaining some kinds of currency, some missions you have to do, but for the most part, it was games where the um, the collection of money was elective. Yeah. Interesting. And yeah, yeah. So, and and then what they would do is they would they could only do it for video games where you could buy th things with real world equivalents. So it couldn't just be magical items. You know, it had to be like a potato, or a sack of rice, or. But could a someone sword. could someone steal the potato or the sack of rice? Um, uh, no, no, that was never a consideration. In these games. See, that's what it is. It's like you, they take the free will out of it. Mm -hmm. I, that would be an interesting. Well, I guess if thing you killed someone, a lot of video games, yes, if you kill someone, their items will drop. Not all of them. So, right. like maybe it's a fifty-fifty shot, depends on the game. And that might be a whole other statistical analysis. But that wasn't even the point. You know, I mean, it was still it was very good. It was it was thorough. I mean, it was like a twenty-five minute video. I mean, he's just whipping off the points like this. So you'd have to sit down with a spreadsheet, and you'd have to be at it for hours to actually have the numbers in front of you to see what he did. But he did he sourced the numbers, and it was an it was statistical analysis. That's on the awesome. economics of video games, and and kids are it's fun, right? Well, which video game character you want to be if you want to be rich? Kids can get into that, right? You know, money's always a motivator, right? You know, it's a, it's a good, especially for the immature when you're, you haven't achieved that wisdom yet, and uh, they haven't even begun to build that hierarchy of needs. So, you know, two cases where, yeah, all right, again, maybe the person who wrote the vi wrote the video. Maybe a little bit of the father, you know, letting the daughter sit in his lap. Child but Protective Services, that was completely just metaphorical. <laughs> okay. just. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, please. No, no, I, I've known a lot of cops. They're actually humans. You know, they're usually good. We, we, we made a lot of jokes about, on the show, about um, the, the black van showing up in the parking lot, but I don't think they're going to show up. I think you're right. <laughs> Oh, those are the so, do, you have, you have, do you have doctor plates on your car? Oh, no, I have EMT plates. EMT. Okay, awesome. Yes, that, you're that, fine. That I am. <laughs> you can drive as fast as you want. <laughs> I, I, got, I, got a, I got to have a lot of tickets. <laughs> Not that I drive uh, fast with my daughter in the car. Or, yeah, uh, I went uh, to the wrong field. Like or did I? I don't know. Um, so, um, all right. Well, anyway, I just, um, I don't know how we got off into that. Um, By the way, it's scary. Um, when I went through my ENT course, yeah. it's six weeks, and it's kind of scary how much they. Oh, I didn't realize you had to. You actually certified as an ENT after you were a doctor. Right, right. So between my Romanian medical degree and my DO degree, I had a little stint in which I got my EMT. Mm -hmm. And but it's amazing how much book it is, and it's like, and this is how you apply the collar. All right. Go to it, guys. And that's, <laughs> it's amazing how much. In, in the software business, they call that fire ready aim. Okay, that's a, that's a very good analogy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Eh, it's only, statistically, it's only a few dead people. Mm. Whatever. <laughs> Bring out your dead. Ding, ding. <laughs> oh, you're a Monty Python fan. Nice. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> He's almost dead. Um. Okay, so there was uh, some other things I wanted to bring up. Oh, yeah, so we were talking about, um, I remember, we were talking about self-experimentation. So uh, Yes, yes. Right. That's how we got off on this crazy tangent. This is what happens on the show. This is a great thing about having a long-form show because you just, you just talk, and then you get off on these crazy tangents, and, like, you talk about things that I never could have guessed. Like, this is not a script. This is just... You see it now, right? It's just total chaos. It's just like little signposts in case we're totally lost in the woods so we can get back to a path where people can not 
fall in a ditch while they're walking with us. <laughs> we are segueing from. Uh, oh, we did watch some shows oh, from nice. uh, <laughs> from topic to topic. Oh yes, yes, we're uh, we're never getting away from the segways. Did you know that uh, the founder, the the owner of Segway, actually died a year ago uh, on a Segway? On a Segway. On a Segway. I think he went off a cliff. I, I, I was like, is this the onion? I don't know. Maybe you could verify that one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. The question is, what today. was the? Was it like an accident or? Yeah, I I think it was, was an accident. Like, I'm sick and tired of this. I think <laughs> the inventor. It was the inventor or oh, the, the current inventor. owner. I think it might have been the current owner, like a year ago, whatever. Who the, the current owner was at the year a year or two ago. Uh, that must have not been very good for the stock. I don't understand why I didn't why it wasn't all over the internet for three days straight. It must have been you know it's been so crazy lately. Maybe they just yeah. it got lost. It just seems like an April first kind of thing. I'm probably been duped. Um, <laughs> Self-experimentation. Anyway, enough of the self There we go. All right. So a British businessman who bought the Segway company less than a year ago, and this was in 2010, uh, who bought the Segway company less than a year ago died after riding one of the scooters off of a cliff and into a river <laughs> near his Yorkshire estate. <laughs> Jim Hesselden, known locally as Jimmy, acquired the Segway so company wondering. from the U.S. inventor Dean Kamen in December 2009. <laughs> And this is written by NBC News. <laughs> and the uh, and owner update, died on updated a on uh, updated September twenty seventh, two thousand ten. What? Now we know why there aren't segways everywhere. <laughs> Come full circle. <laughs> wow. Do you think he was off, or you think he was doing a publicity stunt? <laughs> That's really not good it's publicity, is it? NBC, so. Yeah, yeah, that's what I found too. I looked legit to me. So I'm like, is this real? I mean, I, I don't know if people just didn't report it because they couldn't believe it. Uh, anyway. Uh, I think because it was a, a uh, European happening. Instead of like an American that wasn't covered by all of our outlets, it was covered by the like, European ones, like BBC and whatever. Uh, okay, I got it. Okay. <laughs> well, wow, you're so deadpan when you read that. <laughs> that was really good. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> um, so. Pickle Rick. <laughs> so the reason, the thing I wanted to ask you about about yes. this is vitamin yes. C and vitamin D. So there's some people out there doing mega doses, and the thing that's really interesting about this is I have a I have a problem with status. You know, people who worship the state as if it's a god and think that the system is infallible, whatever the system happens to be. Which of course we've obviously they've probably already gotten off of the podcast at this point because we've completely dispelled that myth. But you know, the, I I just seen some terrible arguments where people are angry with people for taking mega doses of C and D, either when they get sick or just in general to avoid getting sick. As far as I can tell, there is no downside to this other than just a lot of peed out C and D. Oh, I mean, there's a big downside. Oh, there is? What's the downside? Talking about self-experimentations, the first medical fact I read uh, as in my medical career was that... Um, the numbers elude me right now, but it was something like if you take more than four grams of vitamin C per day, after three days, you will get explosive diarrhea. Okay. So I said, oh, that's very interesting. And as a good medical student, I said, what exactly constitutes explosive diarrhea? So I started taking eight grams a day. It was like a prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> On the third day, the <laughs> gates did open and the flood did cometh. It was uh, it was pretty wow, horrible. Wow! Really? I was sitting at my desk here studying. Right. And uh, where that chair is, just like two meters away, was the toilet. Mm -hmm. I basically almost did not yeah, make it sorry. at all to to the bathroom. Really? I felt it coming. If I could have been on worldwide TV shaking hands with the Queen of England... And it wouldn't have mattered. It would not have mattered. There was no force <laughs> stopping this. <laughs> I think we've all been there. <laughs> corks, no, no, no. Corks, crazy glue. Uh, nothing was stopping it. I run to the pull bathroom. Rank on this, huh? I pull down my pants. Before my butt even hits the toilet, it explodes. Now, it wasn't the quantity. It wasn't the velocity. It was the quantity at that velocity, which was truly explosive. Did you break the ceramic? 
<laughs> was, no, but I thought I, bro I thought I broke the rim. <laughs> I was rocking back and forth, <laughs> praying to whatever God would hear me, going, please, just, I, I think, you know, I think I busted my sphincter, please, no. I just, I was just, I was in so I much pain. This? I really <laughs> thought I, I exploded my sphincter. Right, right. It was just warm back there. It was moist. I was afraid to wipe because I was just afraid just to have a bunch of blood on my hand. Wow. Eventually, 10 minutes later, I manned up. I wiped myself. There was no blood. I took a shower. So that, that was C specifically you were doing? That was vitamin C. So okay. maybe the people who were mad at the people taking mega doses of vitamin C was because they did that at them. the Christmas party or <laughs> <laughs> something happened with the mega doses. Uh, it's starting yeah. to sound like an x lax prank. <laughs> it, it was, um, so yeah, yeah. self-experimentation self is very important because now I tell my patients, I say, listen, if you're going to do it 500 three times a day or 1,000 twice a day, anything more than 1,000, you poop out. Please don't go past a thousand twice a day. Nice. And they, they look at me. They go, "Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> Are you having a flashback?" You're there. Back? You're there when I'm it happens, there. right? No. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> self Dang, that's a great story. I'm so glad I asked about it. Self-experimentation is very important. <laughs> uh, but you know, you could have some vitamin D toxicity. Um, right. Well, I know D. In, I know in sunlight, you can your body can produce in the most extreme case up to fifty thousand. Um, Depends. Yeah. The, the the most people need are arms and legs exposed for about ten minutes on a sunny day without sunscreen. That's right. that's your dose of vitamin C for the day. Uh, which is which is about where someone uh, vitamin D excuse never me, in the vitamin. sun and Irish bursts into flame. So <laughs> 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 having a few Irish friends, <laughs> beach ghost. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, let's see. So that was that was not where I thought that was going to go at all. Um, Pickle Rick. Pickle Rick. <laughs> so, um, uh, oh yeah, one thing I wanted to see. You, d you didn't mention PGS or the press uh, gaining scores. Now this is like very similar to the net promote scores. Yeah. Um, is that is that the si a different scoring system? Is that just the company that's using the uh, the NPS system? Well, I, I really just don't understand uh, what that is. Could you explain it? No. Okay. Is it terrible? You're asking me to go into the psychological profile of the seven dwarfs. Okay. Um, I, I, <laughs> it's um, not even real? <laughs> it's, it's completely human construct. You're asking me to differentiate, you're putting two pieces of crap in front of me and saying, well, which one do you think smells better? Okay, it's, I think we've reached the bottom of the barrel with this uh, with this uh, physician rating system. So they're oh, the worst. It's horrible. Right? It's horrible. Yeah. It's it's absolutely atrocious. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't I can't say how bad this is for the system. And you know what? You can know you watch. In medicine, is always a lag before it becomes public knowledge. Six months go by, a year go by. Like patients come in and they go, "Oh, I, you know, I just read blah 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 and blah blah blah." And I'm very polite about the whole thing. Was like, "Yeah, we knew that like five years ago." Right. You know, and it just becomes public knowledge after a year, and it was, um, uh, it's just, it's oh, just bloody you. awful. You know. Thank you so much. Sure. Sorry, it's all this uh, human suffering. Needs a little lubrication. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. To, to, to overcoming oh. human suffering. All right. All right. I believe that whole cheers thing came from um, um, where they clinked the glasses came from the Vikings, so that if any of the glasses were poisoned, they would poison everyone else when they splashed at each other. So oh, my really? splash was yeah, yeah. I think that that was that was what I read. I don't know if it's true, but I think it is. I'm, I checked it a few times. So, is that why they pass a doobie around the circle? Yeah, oh, maybe. <laughs> is that how that came about? It's like you go first. No, I think that's Russian roulette or hot potato. You know, in case the fuzz shows up. <laughs> <laughs> I just dated myself with the word fuzz. Um, fuzz. fuzz. It's the fuzz, run! Fuzz. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, okay, so it's kind of like a little bit like the Better Business Bureau, it sounds like. Who? The, uh, the, 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 uh, the scores that no, we were talking about. No, there's no better end in the, in the sentence. I mean, the Better Business Bureau is pretty bad. They have a reputation. Basically what they do is if they get complaints, they just lower your score, and then if you, you pay them off to raise your score back up. So that's, uh, Maybe that's how they work. I don't know. Right. 
they're, so they're private even, companies, so that, you know. So, it's, so uh, what you're saying is that model superior to this? <laughs> okay. All right. I don't know. I, I don't. You know, it's just. Like I don't that, understand it, so I can I'm kind of lost without you. Know, uh, so. so, so basically, I mean, the way it basically works, um, if it's a score of one to five or one to ten, depending on the system, and if you get uh, if you get one to three, if you get uh, uh, what is it? If it's like one to three, you get like negative a hundred. Uh, if you get four or five, if you get a four, it's a zero. If you get a five, it's a hundred. Mm -hmm. Or it's like below, it's like two hundred. It's this really messed up equation that if you get one thing against you, mm -hmm. it just completely throws out. It makes no sense. It's not a pure statistical like, hey, five percent of the patients think that you're a weenie head. No, no. It's more like your <laughs> score is your score is like negative twenty. <laughs> but like three people made a comment and one person didn't right. like you, so yeah. all of a sudden like your score is like negative twenty. Well, it's, so it's, it's like, you know to use pop culture, it's like the house problem, right? You know, a brilliant doctor that is just a dick because everyone's an idiot around him, and he's very frustrated. And maybe he has his own social shortcomings, but you know, if you sometimes you got to tell people stuff they don't want to hear. You know, you gotta lose weight. But but how messed up is that? Yeah. The fact that the people watch a house like sh like show uh, excuse me watch a show like House. Yeah. And they really like the character. It's like oh, it's been on for so many seasons, but they don't want a doctor like that. Right. They don't want the smart doctor who just can figure it out and just really has no interest. I, I see. I wouldn't have a problem. I, I I would I would appreciate the brutal honesty. I Me mean, too. You know, yeah. I mean. Me too. Especially if the, you know, as the thing. I think the thing that makes brutal honesty hurt less is time. So the more time you have with your doctor, the more brutally honest they can be because the more time they have to establish rapport. But if the insurance company is also simultaneously sh chopping off time you can spend with them, then they don't have time to establish that rapport to give them the brutal truth to keep them actually healthier. So it's almost like a catch-22. You can't get out of it. The insurance company doesn't uh, do that? Uh, the insurance company doesn't limit the time you no. doctors spend with the patients? Are they just cranking through them to try to pay down their debts? I mean, what's happening there? Yeah. Oh. Okay. The insurance company. So it's the AMA. It's not the. It's the AMA limiting the number of doctors and the, the short number of doctors desperately trying to pay back their enormous student loans, and there not being enough doctors out there. No, the insurance company basically says we're going to give you this much. Right. So it's like, oh man, I gotta you know I gotta keep up. I gotta see you know I can't see twenty patients a day anymore. I gotta see forty. Right. But it's at the end of the day, it's that uh, which really sucks. Right. You know, but um, it was that provider's choice. That physician's choice to to do that. Um, I was in private practice for two years, and every patient, a new patient that came to me, mm -hmm. the first time I met a patient was a one-hour visit. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so great! Man, I wish you were my doctor. That's great. Yeah, 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 and I, yeah, and I wish I didn't get twenty dollars from your insurance for a one-hour visit. Wow. Like one time, I got. Geeks make a lot more than that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's Mickey Mouse. Man, what is? That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So I have. Uh, I once got a check in the mail for like, uh, uh, it was like 34 cents for the check. I couldn't even afford a stamp to, set, to write back a letter saying F you based on you know, that check they gave me. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, so wow. I spent an hour with a patient and you know. Have you thought about just doing a cash practice? I know of at least one ear, nose, and throat doctor in Great Neck that does that. Too, it, it just is too much headache. Right, right. Uh, it's just too much headache. I'd rather work for someone he else. Was, he was very good too. So you know, I was like, the first time I heard that, I was like, "What? You want cash? What are you talking about?" Because he wanted. I was talking to him about possibly doing a uh, a surgery, uh, and uh, and he wanted cash. But then at another time, I went to him, and I was uh, I was having an allergic reaction to my blood pressure medication. And my general, who was very good, uh, didn't catch it. But he said, I don't know what's going on. Uh, mm -hmm. The first thing we got to do is make sure your throat's not going to close tonight. So he sent me to an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And he's like, he, did, he didn't even know I was on blood pressure medication. He's like, are you on blood pressure medication? Because my face had swollen up asymmetrically. And he's like, uh, uh, I'm like, yeah. He's like, Ramipril? Yeah. Stop taking it. <laughs> there we go. So that was good. He was, he was worth the money to pay for cash. So I, I, I wish more people, I wish people had the disposable income to make those choices because then maybe there would be some external pressure or competitive pressure on the outside, on the insurance company saying, look at these doctors who are successful, have this great reputation, you know, 
getting kicked off the island might actually end up being better for you, so to speak. You know? Yeah. Well, look, when, you, when I grind... It's a shame you're not in private practice, I guess that's what I'm saying. When I did the numbers to make the same money I, I work making for other people, mm -hmm. I'd have to make two, uh, two times more money. And that means more time in the office, more time with patients, less time with my family. I'm a family man. I love my family above every, everything else. Um, so Kids it's, are wells. They're endless wells that you can just throw love into and yeah. make them better. Even if it's marginally, it's worth it. Absolutely, and my my, dedic my dedication is completely to my family. Everything else comes second, including medicine. You know, my mm -hmm. my daughter and my wife are the most important thing to me. My my mother, my stepfather, my uh, my sister. Um, everything else is just whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's all incidental. It's just things to fill the time uh, as we before we die. Right. You know. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, so you, you can always make you you know you can make your mark on the world, but. I mean, one way that you definitely will make the mark in the world, possibly forever, if things go well, is your kids. Yes. Yeah. For sure, you will make a mark in the world with them. So, and then of course you can make other marks too. You know, carve mm -hmm. some stuff in the tree, maybe uh, you know, spray paint, paint some stuff on the stone. But you know, really, they're the ones that are going to be around. Their, Absolutely. Your genetics will be around, in hopefully in ten thousand years in some form. With your descendants, I don't think we're going to be around ten thousand. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, actually, uh, so that's great. Uh, that's a fork right into immortality. What do you think about what is about the ethics of immortality? I mean, if we get to the, it seems like there's some people saying it seems plausible in our lifetimes that we may even get to the point where we can reverse aging. Why? Move your head. Oh, sorry. Um. Uh, you don't think so? You don't think it's worth it? No, no, I'm not saying it. People fine. are going to do it. Why? Unless we stop them. Why? Because why would anyone die? Why would anyone Death is scary. Them? The worms crawl in. The why? worms crawl out. Yeah. Why? It's the ultimate adventure. It's the ult I don't want to die, right. but I am so looking forward to death. Right. It is the next, it's like the Star Trek, you know, oh, dang, you know dang, the, dang. The, the, the spaceship <laughs> flying so off So what you're space. saying is on your tombstone, you want them to put a sketch in the Enterprise. <laughs> That could be doable. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's a good idea, right? I just see, do you think there's a place come up with right here? I think yeah. it's like a place that does that. I'm sure. Yeah. You can probably put whatever you want on there. You can probably put a poop emoji if you. <laughs> you just picture someone at the tombstone <laughs> factory going, "Oh God, not on one of these." <laughs> um, yeah, yeah okay. but I, I don't understand why someone would want to. Have you ever seen the movie In Time? No. So that was a good sci-fi movie on this. Like what? What? The, so, of course, immediately there's a massive overpopulation problem because no one ever dies. Everyone's young and healthy all the time. Um, uh, so what do you do? So what they did was uh, they, time became currency, and everybody was assigned a certain amount of time at their birth, and then they had to earn it after that. And, of course, there's constant inflation. It's harder and harder to earn time as time goes on, and um, hilarity ensues. <laughs> I saw uh, the trailer where he goes, eight minutes for a latte or something like that. Right, right. Is that the movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the movie. I did see a series that's really great. Um, it's about a guy who is a soldier who gets killed, who gets brought back at a time where people swap into different bodies. Mm -hmm. um, you know that show? It's on, uh, I think it's a, like a, one of these Hulu or Amazon originals. No, I don't. I don't. It, it's really a great series. It's about people who could transfer, they could back up their consciousness, and if they die, they download load their... Um, oh, oh, this is a Black Mirror. This is a Black Mirror episode. Not Black Mirror. It was, okay. so, it was something Black else. Mirror did this, too. So they, yeah. they had a, basically, they had a big database where people could go in and out of a shared oh, virtual reality. Carbon. Altered Carbon, that's it. Oh, okay, cool. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you see that one? Uh, I did not see that one. Yeah, I highly recommend it. Altered you know, Carbon, it okay. Has, has a lot of these ethical issues, uh, dilemmas, and um, moral aspects to it. Okay. It's more like a detective, but they, you know, they touch on these things. Things. Right. Um, cool. I'll check that out. Yeah, but immortality. Oh, you know, the problem is we're, we're rapidly we 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 live inside a closed system. Right. This planet is a closed system. Right. We only have a limited amount of resources. Of I course. Think, yeah. I think we should all live our life. Right. Be happy, and die happy. Right. And give the next generation a shot. There's no reason why we should all become immortal, consume resources unlimited, and take away from the other generations. You could literally, so I completely agree with you, but I had to hear it from you and see what you thought on it. Um, I tell my kids that, you know, when, from the beginning, when they were forming their archetypes about death, I was like, you know, at some point, 
the people who are here have to die and move on so that you can yeah. you know, use the resources and take up the space. Now, I think a lot of the numbers that are out there uh, are inflated. You know, I don't think we're going to... I've seen numbers as low as 12 billion where we're going to have problems on the planet. I, personally, I've seen... I, I saw numbers that seem credible to me, 40 billion. But yes, there is definitely a limit where the amount of people on the planet hits a resource limit. And even, even if technology has come along, hopefully we'll be able to leave the planet and terraform others before that happens and we'll we won't face the ethical dilemma of restricting population growth. I, I hope not. Yeah, I hope we can avoid it because- No, I no, I hope we don't leave the planet. Go on. <laughs> no, I really, I really hope we, I hope, really hope we don't go to colonize other worlds, because okay. until I mean, Mars, we, is, Mars is just a rock, man. Who oh, that's fine. Mars is fine. I don't. Yeah, mind yeah that's what I'm talking about. No, no, Mars is fine. I oh, thought you meant no like, Martians, man. Yeah, Martian rights. I, I thought you meant the, those new planets they found. Oh, oh, oh like Earth, Earth, uh, Earth type planets. Earth type planet. I don't yeah. think we should go to Earth type planets. Mm. Okay. Because we haven't figured out our shit here. Right. It's like if we just we just want to go because we're outrunning our resources to the next planet. Yeah. We just basically became viruses in the universe. Yeah. Going to the next place to consume the resources. Right. To the Never next planet. Never actually solving the problems. Right. So, balance. Right. So once I'm all for it. Once you get that balance of problems, once ever, once we're okay with it, then yeah, we'll explore, okay. go to different yeah, places. That's fair. But not until then. I, I would. I actually. So I have a first contact protocol. So all right. So a lot of people are. This is something that's getting explored now. We're starting to think about the planet as a type one civilization. And okay, what if we're just a species, and we have to deal with the universe as a species? You know, not a lot of people are on board with this, but it's more than zero, which is an improvement. Um, and thinking about, okay, if you're an alien, let's suppose that there are spacefaring aliens. They're probably here already, in my opinion. If there's spacefaring aliens and space travel is technologically possible. Let's say warp fields are the answer and Star Trek had it right all along. Just as one possible example, or wormholes, or there's a thousand things. Um, they're probably just outside of our periphery of our ability to scan them, and they're watching us. And they're waiting for something to happen. For some indication <coughs> of when we reach that point where we do have balance, where we're no longer out of control and no longer a virus waiting to blight the universe where we wouldn't intrude on another life space and to help us then, to, to share their technology and to share the resources of the local universe with us. So are they, are they that bored? Are they hang around watching us? Why not? I mean, come on! It's like <laughs> we're from the future. Well, that's, that's like, well I mean, so we're, we're almost we're we're getting there now ourselves, right? I mean, you're very busy, right? But what's happening in a lot of other fields is that a lot of things people like me are coming along and automating jobs away? You know, and the jobs are becoming. You know, this we are not in a labor glut yet, but it is. There's a risk of one. It is on the horizon. You know, I mean, we could have a sudden labor glut. You know, we're a few algorithm, a few algorithms away theoretically. So, if that happens, um, you know, as if the if I won't even say it would be a new event if the current event continues on the on the on the current track. You know, and the and the automation starts eating into the job market, we may find ourselves a species with a lot, whole lot of free time and nothing to do. Now, if you have space faring capability and it isn't too expensive energy-wise, it would just be like people who go to the rainforest to look at frogs. You know, there would be aliens that would come and look at us and, hey, what are they doing? You know, I, I really actually, my, my theory about aliens is that they're really not extraterrestrials. Right. They're terrestrials from the future. That's possible too. I think they just. I think it's a lot easier to rip a hole in time and space. Right. Yeah, yeah. Stick to the good stuff. <laughs> uh, rip, rip a hole in time and space and see yourselves, mm -hmm. rather than traveling across the cosmos and watch a bunch of monkeys try to figure out their problems. Right, right. You know, you travel across a galaxy and you. It's like. Let's wait to see what they do. If they get it right, we'll step in. Like you know, from the from the physician mentality, uh, my thing is like, wow, look at them. They're heading for badness. Maybe I should tell them. Right. Why right. would they say like? So you're saying it would be eth eth for an ethical creature, it would just be torture, watching a, 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 a another species slowly evolve towards becoming a. Uh, an equivalent, a peer species. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think it's like. What are you doing? Don't do that. Like, who the hell? Why are you lighting nuclear weapons off on your planet? 
like, like who, who, like who do they piss off to get the job to watch the humans evolve? Right. Sitting on a station, going, "Oh God, <sighs> what the hell are they doing now?" It's like, it's like, oh, I shouldn't have called that guy an a-hole. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I think it's you know based on our. Th- That's very Douglas Adams of you. <laughs> based on our, based on the theories I hear about, you know, quantum physics and time travel, there's a what's it called, non-interference issue. Yeah. I think if if we go on the fact that uh, we establish this as a law to not interfere if we develop time travel, that makes sense why aliens come and don't say anything because we're just not, don't interfere, just watch. Mm -hmm. Observe observe the monkeys. This is where we came from. Just like when people go to the zoo, it's like, I went to the zoo, I I, I don't like zoos, but I went to the zoo and I never spoke with a monkey. I never started speaking with a monkey. And I I think aliens are the same. They came to see us, look at the monkeys, and... uh, So so I did a thing on my site where I have a, a couple of economic, talked about a couple of economic theories based on the 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 capuchin monkey st- study where they they had currency so yeah that was a thing where the capuchin monkeys were taught to use currency and then it was an accident and they spilled the money into the cage by accident you know, had a basket it, of money this is real money coins yeah they right, took right. them six months to teach them how to use money to get food and stuff so okay. they were trying to economists were doing this they were trying to see if there was like some in- inherent human behavior and the capuchin monkeys um, um, they dropped the like there was a basket full of coins or something, it just fell in the cage by accident. By accident, okay. By accident. Right. okay. So the monkeys immediately went, all the male monkeys went and grabbed the coins and then started paying the female monkeys in exchange for sex. So basically, when left their own devices, the first thing they did was prostitution. Yep. So anyway, I, I, I got that from um, uh, from Brogan, actually. He was on, he did it in a comedy bit, he misrepresented it, but that's that's more or less what happened. I didn't so, think that was, I think that was what the case was. No, it definitely was coins. It was Regardless. Great. Kombucha monkeys are, are like sugar, so that was, the coins were traded for sugary treats. That kombucha was the, monkeys? That was the economy. Are yeah. they like acidophilus monkeys? So we, we went to... <laughs> <laughs> we had to kombucha acid off. get it? No. Uh, no. Okay. Probiotics? No. Oh, okay. Kombu- yeah. Anywho. Anyway, we were in Pickle Rick! Pickle Rick. So we went to San Diego, and uh, there was a kombucha monkey exhibit there. Okay. And my family's watching the monkeys. I completely ignored the monkeys and talked to a human, because there was a, there was a zookeeper there that I wanted to discuss the kombucha monkey. So. There we go. I kind of like... It was really a roundabout way to say I, I agree with you. <laughs> I went to the zoo and ignored the most interesting thing there. So yeah. I talked to a human. Did this happen to be standing there? It was also interested in the monkeys. Yeah. Well, anyway. But I yeah uh, just the whole alien thing. I believe in the extraterrestrials. You know, I mean, it's I plausible. Just, I don't know. It's I don't plausible. know if there's a singularity. I don't know if there's. I just don't understand what they would be doing here watching us. That's all. It's like. Right, right. It's like how how much can you sit at the zoo watching animals you know, <laughs> until you get bored out of your mind? Like I gotta go do something else, you know? Right, right. I don't. I really. I don't know why people collect stamps. I don't get it. I completely don't get it. It just seems like the most boring thing in the world to me. Or coins, you know, not not like valuable coins where it has some intrinsic value or has some historical, but just like you know, want to have every single quarter that was ever minted. Yeah, I just don't get it. It just seems incredibly boring to me. <laughs> but you know, someone's really into that. Or toy trains, right? You know. How would you feel if you were taking apart the mothership and all the aliens come up to you and go, "Want to see my stamp collection?" <laughs> <laughs> like what? That's, I guess that's kind of what's going. Can you please just anal probe me and let's make this interesting? <laughs> I think I, I think I know what uh, one of the title one of the images in your title card is going to be. <laughs> well, <laughs> Stamp with an alien on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, all right, so um, let's see. There's lots of things you can talk about. Um, so biometrics. Oh, so what are your feelings on any input or thoughts on biometrics? Uh, like using using biological features to authenticate yourself with computer systems. Mixed feelings. Mixed feelings. You know, because there's always going to be some a hole out there who wants to do something with the information. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have no problem with, you know, scanning my retina or my fingerprint. Um, I just don't like, I mean, we already do it, Mm -hmm. right? You know, these phones with the fingerprint ID. Mm -hmm. You really don't know where those fingerprint information goes. Yes, okay, you're thinking. You you don't, you don't. It goes somewhere into, we don't know it sits on the phone. And uh, (coughs) again, with the aliens, what the hell are you going to do with it? Right, right. It's like, oh, we got Kachoba's fingerprint. It's like, okay, pick a trick. What are you going to do with it? You know, it's like. So, so, like, like, the problem with biometrics, so the thing is, biometrics were originally used as high end security as part of a multi security platform in, like, 
high confidence kind of situations for government stuff. Right. So where only the only time someone would have stolen it, the only time that you would you would ever be able to use it for anything was if uh, like a spy were to steal it so they could get into you know a research facility or something yeah. like that. So, um, but of course now we have fingerprint scanners and now there's even optical scanners are becoming more um, prevalent. So this, this ties back to the de identified genetic data, don't worry. So uh, I didn't just go off on a, on a pier. Well, I kind of did, but I'm walking towards land. So um, as a geek, I'm constantly warning people, don't give people your genetic data. Don't give people your bio. Don't give them your fingerprints. Don't give them your eye prints. Don't give them your genetics. And of course, that's going to ruin a lot of people's dating lives. I, I, it is. It is. Well, <laughs> aside from <laughs> aside from um, uh, one night stands and turkey pasters, um, <laughs> I, I'm t I was thinking more along the lines of going to one of those genetic heritage sites. You know, and putting in your genetic code. You know, now they have your genetics in digital form. You know, and you're completely depending on their data team to get it right forever, right? Because they're not going to delete that stuff. No. Nope. You know, I mean, they may say they are, and they may actually do it, but if they don't say they're going to, they're not going to delete it. They're going to keep it forever because that has value, and the companies don't throw away value ever if yep. they don't have to. So. Um, the problem with biometrics is they don't ever go away. So a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of um, focus right now on HIPAA and um, uh, making, uh, oh, I, I wanted to share a story from you from a scientist at Rockefeller. Um, a lot of um, um, uh, HIPAA compliance things focusing on um, uh, keeping the de-identification process secure and the de-identified data you know, the identified data versus the de-identified data, completely separate and not, they never shall touch. So I was at a meeting in Rock, and one of the genetic scientists said, well, you know, this is, we were, we were talking about the HIPAA requirements. And of course, you know, at one level, you're just trying to satisfy the law. You're just trying to not get, keep Johnny Law off your case and not create a problem. And he's like, you know, it doesn't really do that much because we're already at the point now where I can look at someone's DNA and say, oh, that's that guy. Because there's enough unique identifiers in the DNA. You know, oh, he's a brunette. Oh, he's got uh, blue eyes. Oh, he's Caucasian. Uh, he's about five foot eight, you know. Uh, okay, he's a medium build, you know. Uh, probably not that heavy. Definitely doesn't have this disease or that disease or this disease or that disease. Looks like he's about this old, right? And so if you can do that, the de-identified data is becomes the identified data. So there's all this data out there that we're presuming to be safe that we're, mi we're mixing up together, and it may come to a point where that genetic fingerprint is completely reversible instantaneously. So I have no idea what the implications of that are. I was just wondering if you had heard this before or... No, but, but it's, it's kind of, you know what, there's always going to be the antithesis to what you're striving to do. Okay. First of all, just to backtrack a little bit, I don't want to interrupt you. No, it's fine. I, it, you know, retina scans and fingerprints scare the crap out of me, personally, right. especially if I work for the government, because there's going to be someone walking around with my eyeball on my hand right. up to a scanner, you know, so I, I, it's like, what's the point? You know, you could still get someone's fingerprint if you... Fingerprints are easy. Yeah. yeah that's, that, especially if you're physical access, that's simple. You can do it with scotch tape and dust. No, or know. they could just cut off the finger and just yeah, take yeah. The finger. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to get at. Oh, you know? okay. uh, cut off the finger. Uh, you know, it's very romantic in the movies with the scotch tape and the, the right, mist right. and the stuff. They're just going to take your finger, you know, to go right, do what they right. got to do. Um, I'm sorry, I backtracked and I have to forward track. Right, we right. Were so we're about talking about we're talk biometrics and I was talking about genetic reversibility. You know what's going to happen? I'll tell you right now what's going to happen. If it gets to that point, there's going to be people out there. Oh, it's getting there already. But it's going to be people who are going to say, what's the next step? You know what? Buy my virus and it will go into your cells and they can't read your genes anymore. Ah, okay. That's, that's what's going to happen. That was very, that was very good. It's going to happen. There's always going to be someone who's going to know how to overcome the system or loop the system somehow. Right. And they're going to do it for money too. So, so, so this is this is so. This got me thinking about how genetic genetic scientists work. So, what do they do when they're interested in a particular gene sequence? They fluoresce the genes, right? 
So they add in markers, and then and then those markers will actually glow in the dark. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty um, trippy looking. Yeah, yeah, and they, they, they'll, they'll, they'll be able to shine a light on them and be able to spot them in the actual DNA after they've added, you know, they CRISPRed it in or something. Um, so um, that got me thinking, okay, so as we start creating designer babies, we're actually going to start seeing people adding in the same genes over and over and over again. So at some point, having certain genetic markers is going to mark you as a blue blood and can actually make you vulnerable, you know, if you're in some de-identified da database, you may also be able to identify someone from <laughs> their de-identified genetic data yeah. um, uh, based on income. Because, you know, oh, they can afford these three. Oh, they can afford these six. Oh, they can afford these 10, you know, when, they, when they're creating their designer baby. And then that gives you some idea of what their wealth is. So, so what's the difference between that and having a prestigious name? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, it's like, it oh be, crap, he's a um, fill in the blank Rockefeller, or, or, you know, or yeah, yeah. Kennedy. It's like, well, there, there's your blue or blood. Conversely, or conversely, yeah. um, uh, you know, you could get to a point where, um, you know, the equivalent of the French mobs during the, the French Revolution, you know. Most most activism now is you know hackers, right? I mean, uh, I was just talking about it with, with Lee. Beto O'Rourke was in a hacker group. He's caught. You know, nobody seems to be talking about it. They're not covering it in the press. But yeah, he was in a very famous hacker group that had meaningful financial damages against random companies because they were, you know, they were trying to get Microsoft to fix their bugs. So they were trying to do a good thing, but maybe you know a less a less ethical path to do it. But hacktivism is real, and it's getting bigger. I mean, we have a hacktivist running for president of the United States. <laughs> you know, who's that? So, Beto, Beto O'Rourke, um, the guy from Texas. Uh, let me put it before you go on. Let me put this to you in, in reference to where I am at. Right. I had a patient yell at me because I didn't know who Joe Biden was. Okay. <laughs> okay. She's like, my friend just had dinner with Joe Biden. I looked at her all honesty in my heart. I said. Who's Joe Biden? <laughs> and she goes, the Vice President of the United States. And she starts yelling at me like, whoa. It's like, it's like I don't know. I don't follow politics. No, no, no it's you fine. Know, it's, it's fine. It doesn't matter who he is. But, but he's a when, hacker? But he's a hacker, yeah. I'll so one of the presidential, one of the front-running Democratic presidential candidates is a hacker. Is a caught, red-handed hacker. So, and a hacktivist. So he isn't just hacking for money. You know, he's hacking to try to change nice. the world. You know, I never voted in my life. Yeah. But uh, he might be the first one I vote for. Oh, interesting. <laughs> you know, a lot of a lot of people seem to be having that reaction, and it's weird because I'm 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 isolated in the computer field, and I you know I, I spend a lot of time defending against attacks, and you know people are trying coming in from the internet trying to take over servers and take over campuses and yeah. coming into the network, and they're. Um, and the security guards, guys are cursing them out under their breath and I can't believe these guys, they're terrible, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter what their motivation is. You try to have that conversation with them, they're like, I don't care. It's wrong, you know? Right, yeah, diff different proto different uh, archetypes. That's right, 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 right. Uh, different so, personalities, absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, so I just thought I'd get your, your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, and just for the record, I'm not anti-democratic. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I believe in a free society. I'm probably more democratic than other people. It's just, there's no, but no one has come along yet to motivate me to get out of my chair. Right. You ever listen to Bill no, Hicks? No, no, I, I understand. You yeah, know? oh yes, I love Bill Hicks. It's like, He's awesome. I'll vote for the puppet on the right. I'm going to vote for the puppet on the left. Wait, there's one guy in the middle. It's like, go to sleep, America. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it, that's what it is. Well, the Simpsons it's version just, with the two tentacle monsters after they take their masks off. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's like it's, it's all the same to me. It's like no one has motivated me. Right. And uh, I, challenge, I challenge them. I challenge a politician to actually get me off a seat, to actually spend my day to go vote. You're, you're, they don't, I hate to say this, but they don't care about you. No, Unless they don't. you're donating, they don't care about you. And that's perfectly fine. You're too I, far I, on the edge. You're away at the edge of the periphery, and they're like, eh, whatever. Yeah, I that don't, guy, uh, I'll never get him. And that's perfectly fine. Yeah. And that's perfectly fine with me. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, respect my personal beliefs. I don't care beliefs. about me either. No, they don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't. I can't even think of a single candidate that's ever that's represented all my views. The only person who's cared about is, is the Bitcoin AI. <laughs> <laughs> I know it cares about me. Singularity for president. Singularity. <laughs> you know what? I would vote for the singularity. It's like, <laughs> I, for one, welcome the singularity. <laughs> well, let's see how many presidents we had until now. How many humans we had? 
<laughs> I don't see what... The only, all, the only person that scares me isn't a person at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice. Um, so, uh, let's see. What else was there that I wanted to talk about? I heard, uh, maybe Steve could back us up on this. I heard a lot of people can, uh, a lot of people go into the voting booths and they vote for Batman and Superman and Spider-Man. <laughs> Last year, um, Harambe was the big one. Who was it? Harambe. Who's Harambe? Um, uh, do you know about the Harambe thing? Uh, that, Harambe was like this internet it. meme. He was a uh, gorilla that got uh, got, got killed oh, in oh, yeah, its booth right. because it was like dragging a kid through like its exhibit because the kid fell in. So then there's a whole like, internet motion. It's like you not, didn't actually hurt the kid yet. They were just worried he was yeah, going to. Yeah, so I'm not going to say the, the term that they use. You can Google that. But uh, right. Harambe was like this viewed as this big icon. And then when people didn't want to vote for Hillary or Trump, they went into the booth and they wrote in Harambe. Nice. And I think he was the number one write in. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> if I knew he was running, I would have voted for him. It's like, was there? There's like, there's definitely a supervillain in the Batman universe, in the DC universe, where that was a gorilla. I forget what his name was. Oh, uh, Krog, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> By the way, I really feel bad about that gorilla. They didn't have to kill the gorilla. Really? They don't have tranquilizers in the zoo. Yeah, that's silly. It's I agree with you. She probably was just going to cuddle the kid, right? Because all no, all kid, mammals the, are have was that actually cute like holding the kid by the like dragging it through the exhibit. Oh, he was dragging yeah, it. It was like dragging the kid. Although, the okay, I didn't realize there was actual danger. I thought yeah. he was just no. He was fine. It was dragging, but it wasn't like costly dragging. It was just it dragging. Was like, it was like through water and stuff. Uh, okay. Yeah, but I think it was. Well, he, legit, well the gorilla probably okay. didn't realize there was any. Because a, a gorilla yeah. baby would probably not have a problem with that. Yeah, it was probably like, well, it's kind of like weak for like a non-gorilla baby, you know. Uh, but uh, I don't think the gorilla meant. What is harm. with this sa weird, sickly, pale gorilla? Very strange. I have to bring it over here to protect it. I think everyone. Who was watching should have just thrown their weed and their CBD in the pit. <laughs> Let the gorilla eat it until it passed out. Whoa, I mean, man. Is this really happening? <laughs> oh, look at this hairy baby chimp. <laughs> hey, who knows? Maybe have that's, that's how people got started. You never know. Once we figured out fire. Do you know, uh, actually, one of the... Uh, Steve, Steve, help us out. Mm -hmm. There was actually someone who... Um, I heard that they did research. They found some monkeys on the border with the desert and the jungle. Yeah. Who were... Who they just... The researchers noticed they were flipping over rocks. And they're like, they're eating something. And once they went to examine it, there were psychotropic mushrooms they were eating. Oh, cool. So the theory is that there were some monkeys living in an area with a lot of psychotropic mushrooms. And that's and that's, that's how we made the next jump. Oh, so that's they're not the only animals either. So there's definitely monkeys that um, uh, that look for partly decomposed grapes or fruits. Yeah, yeah. Not grapes, yeah, but fruits yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to for the alcohol content. There's actually alcoholic monkeys in nature, and um, um, although I don't know if they're called alcoholic, I don't know if they're addicted, but they definitely seek it out. And uh, also uh, reindeer. So you know the the in in Mario, the little uh, the red and white speckled mushrooms. There's actually mushrooms like that in uh, northern Europe, and reindeer seek them out to trip. That's where the flying reindeer comes from. Is that why Grandma got run over? Because <laughs> they were That's tripping. That's where the Santa Claus rain, flying reindeer thing comes oh from. Oh my God! It's from tripping reindeer so eating psychotropic mushrooms. That's so trippy. By the way, I like to make a little footnote here. And that's also where piss comes from. I don't know if you know that. Piss? Yeah. Like yeah. what? So, so that particular kind of mushroom, um, uh, uh, people would eat it, and then if you your body would, it has a bunch of other toxins in it, but it, your body can't process the psychotropic molecule. So if you piss it out and then drink it again, it's actually more intense the second time. So that's where getting pissed gets from comes from. That's the origin of that. That's really trippy. <laughs> That's it really is literally trippy. trippy. <laughs> you know, because there are a lot of there are a lot of shamans and gurus who recommend drinking urine. Right. But you know, by the way, I don't recommend drinking urine. Thank you. By the way, I, recom <laughs> I recommend drinking urine. Thank you. <laughs> nice. And um, <laughs> not, not, not medical not advice. medical advice. Just a personal <laughs> recommendation. Uh, there is uh, to drinking urine. Mmm. Mm. So. Um, They're fluids. Uh, but, you know, to make a little footnote, um, there is uh, heavy, heavy interest. Uh, there is a movement being spearheaded by a, a, a neuropsychiatrist called Dr. Engel. I met him at a medical conference. Okay. 
um, he is actually spearheading the movement to have the FDA um, actually allow phase three trials for psychotropic medications. Mm -hmm. LSD, psilocybin from shrooms. Mm -hmm. um, and ketamine is, is, is still used in the hospitals, but they want to use it for psychotropic uh, reasons. Mm -hmm. um, these medications in the 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, someone came along, some suit came along and said, oh, all these are bad. Let's just make them schedule one, just take them off the market. Right, right, right. With right, the right, reefer sorry. heads and, yeah, oh, yeah, the yeah. reefer's bad and this Schedule is one bad. are the worst kinds of drugs, you know, and or, even though they're not. Or the best kind of drugs. They're the legally they're the worst kind of drugs, but it doesn't necessarily mean that any medical in connection at all to that. No. Actually, the FDA recently approved a stage, uh, a phase three <laughs> trial. That's it, because I gotta drive home at some point. <laughs> Sorry, We're not driving. <laughs> We're actually already at his house. Right, 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 right. So. I can sleep in my car. Yeah. <laughs> That's he late. does that often. He sleeps in his car, <laughs> in his own driveway with the keys not in there. Uh, yeah, well, now that I can say anything I want about my wife, I mean, she's sworn she's not going to watch the show, so I'm like, all right, it's on then. <laughs> like Donkey Kong. <laughs> like Donkey Kong. And they actually, uh, they actually approved a phase three trial for psilocybin mushrooms in refractory depression. Right. Uh, I was speaking to one emergency room doctor. Oh, really? Who he actually... Uh, I, know, I know a guy who's all about psilocybin. Psilocybin. This is actually, uh, he, he actually had a patient who came in and the patient said, I want to kill myself. Legit, I have a plan. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I am truly suicidal. He's like, oh, this guy's going to off himself. Right. Um, so he you has. Guys the, are usually more successful too, right? They, yeah, especially yeah. Uh, unless they're physicians. If they're physicians, men and women are equal. Oh, okay. Yeah, equal lethality. Enough. Equal lethality. Um, okay. So he leaves the emergency room, he goes, he leaves the emergency room for 24 hours, he has his next day off, he comes back. The guy's still in the bed. They can't get a psych consult at that hospital. The psychiatrist hasn't shown up. Mm -hmm. And this guy still wants to kill himself. And he's like, what the hell am I gonna do? You know, this guy's, I can't, this guy's just sitting here, you know? So then he remembers reading something <laughs> about- like bureaucracy to light your spirit. That's right. <laughs> Life's worth living. <laughs> and I really applaud him for doing this. Uh, yeah. Kudos to him. He said, you know, I read something about ketamine used in depression and suicidality. And he actually gave him IV ketamine in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few hours later, the patient and said, can I go home? He's like, well, are you going to kill yourself? He's like, no, I have no idea what I was thinking about. I don't want to kill myself. I want to live. And I've actually met patients who are on ketamine infusion once every two weeks. I mean, these are like real, like these are patients with... For deep, what? For depression or for something else? For suicide attempts. These are people with really deep scars mm -hmm. who really understood that they... like that. No, really deep scars. Not the cutters who just want to feel. Yeah, I've had friends. You know, and they, she gets, they, they, this is one patient that keeps coming to mind, but she gets ketamine infusions every two weeks, and she's like, this is the only thing that keeps me in here. You know, um, this is the only thing that keeps me in this life. I can't, without this, I will, I will kill myself. So, and it takes, and it takes a physician to have the balls or the, Right. Neutral politically correct genitalia for this conversation. The to, moxie. The, the moxie, gonads. The gonads are safe. Gonads. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Have the gonads to say, you know what, this guy's laying here. I'm going to try the ketamine. Yeah. A doctor wouldn't do it. A doctor's like, I'm going to wait for a psychiatrist. Maybe it's a week. I don't care. Right. A physician's like, I'm going to try the ketamine. Let's roll the dice. Let's see what happens. Right. Good. Excellent. Yeah. It's so refreshing when you see someone who's being brave for the sake of someone else. Oh, it's, it's great. a great story. That is like a beautiful story. It's a beautiful story when things go right. Right. When right. things go wrong. Right. You are. He's finished. Yeah. Two times in residency, I went completely opposite against ACLS protocol, Events Cardiac Life Support. Okay. You know the American Heart Association Events no, Cardiac okay. Life Support, and it has very, you know, it has little little boxes with if the patient does this, if the patient does that, you give this medication or you shock. And there are two patients where I did exactly the opposite of what ACLS protocol did. Uh, the patient survived. I Who doc, does? yeah, I documented in my chart. This is how the code ran. Mm. This is, I went against, I put my name on it. I wrote, I went against ACLS protocol at this step in the code because of reasons A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. You know, this is why I did it. Right. I put my stamp and I put my signature on it. I stepped up to the plate. Because that crap could be in court later. So you had to do that. Court. I was resident. I could lose my job. Okay. You're, you're to, done as a doctor. Uh, um, yeah. Go. Ha, good luck finding another job. You wow. Know? wow. Why, why were you fired? I went awesome. against ACLS protocol. Well, 
You know, yeah. go go against it somewhere else. You stupid have to is, the stupid does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow, that's really brave. You know, brave. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was well great done. because, cheers. Uh, it was great because everyone's like, well, you did the right thing. You did the right call. Mm -hmm. But if the patient did not live, mm -hmm. there's only one doctor I know who would have said you did the right call, even though the patient died. Everyone else, I'm pretty sure, would have crucified me. So or, this is, you know, this is one of the things I tell my kids all the time. You know, and um, uh, is you have to be strong to be good. It's not enough to want to do good in the world. You actually have to have the strength, whether it's intelligence as strength. Right. But you know, you have to have the will, the force, the knowledge, the ability. It's not just enough to just ah, I want to be you know, good intentions put, pave the road to hell, but. You have to really know your stuff. You have to study and you have to understand it. I mean, it sounds like you went through medical school twice. So, yeah, yeah. and EMT. <laughs> so, yeah. you get to see the whole picture. Yeah. You know? And a res do you have to do two residencies too? Or? No, just one residency. Okay, that's good. Yeah. I don't know if you had to do a residency. Uh. Yeah, so I got my MD degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, you know, I came back to the States. Uh, uh, I got married. I got divorced. I went through dysthymia. Before I knew it, literally uh, five years of my life just like poof, up and vanished. And I said to myself, okay, you're at the crux in your life. If you, if you really love medicine, you love what you do, and you want to help people, you have to go back to school. Right. No one's hiring anyone after five years. You're right. too far out. You're too far away. You could have perfect board scores. You could be the best person in the world. If, but if it's five years out, no one's hiring you. So it's like make a decision, man up, make a decision, live with it. And I did, and I said, I'm going back to school. Yeah, you know, doing this show is actually kind of scary because I can't really do this. I mean, maybe I can at some point, but yeah. right now, you know, it looks like maybe I can't do this and work full time, and I'm already two years out. So I would say probably five years is also the limit in the tech, in the computer tech field. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like that's that's about when when you get to the point where people are like, mm, you know, there are always extra extra extraneous events, uh, extra genius events, whatever, the external events. Like Y2K was a good example. They were pulling people out of retirement because they just needed bodies to just look through code for Y2K compliant problems. But generally speaking. Yeah, yeah. If once you get uh, once you get about five years out, they're like, yeah, you don't know what's going on anymore. You know, perhaps I'd be an exception because I have this show and because we're constantly talking tech. But yeah, there's um, there's a lot of ageism also in the computer field. So um, yeah. really, how is it in the computer field? Is it more like the silverbacks get the respect? Well, if you're employed, yes, but also at the same time, people are they just. Uh, one of the so the great thing about the computer field is you have to be smart. There's no excuse. It doesn't matter what schooling you have. You can't credential your way into things. I mean, you can get the job, but you can't keep it. You know, you have to actually legitimately be smart. So, and, and companies and H, uh, HR departments and companies eventually figure this out after they get smacked upside the head a few times, and you know, people don't work out. If you think they get it after that. All right. Well, you know. Well, let's put it this way. Because there's so much leverage in the computer, in the computers, it's often a multi-million dollar event when it goes really wrong. So yeah, they do get smacked upside the head. Maybe not by the IT department, maybe by somebody who was affected by the event, other than the IT department. But yeah, someone smacked them upside the head. And you know, you got to get someone who knows what they're doing. You can't just go by their, you know. Um, so, but with that in mind, companies love to hire young guys because they're willing to work 50, 60, 70 hours and drive themselves into the ground. Yeah. Yeah, and then they burn out in their 30s and they're done. No, no, they but the, careers. the first seven seconds, like Steve brought up, it's like, hi, I'm so-and-so. Do they look at you and go, they look at someone and go, wow, look, he has, you know, he has, he's hungry. He's gray hair, he's knowledgeable. Oh. You know, oh, yeah. the professor has the gray hair, uh, you know, is very. Yeah, there's some you know, of that. There's some or of that. is it more like. We're getting more towards that. So I think, I think when I was younger, there was, there was um, for, well, originally everybody worked for the same company their whole life. You right, know, right, right, right. And then we're, now we're getting, now we're like everyone's changing companies every three yeah, to yeah. five years, which is a huge problem with ageism in the IT industry. But now that that number is still shrinking, so it's getting to the point where it's 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 almost ridiculous. Like whenever there's a, a labor shortage, they just, oh screw it, whatever. Just just you know they they they're not legally allowed to be ageist, you know, and they just yeah yeah. <laughs> but you know there's still some of it, but I think it's I think it's improving. I think we're going to get. Uh, um, 
I just don't know why there's this idea that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I mean, it's one. Th so there's, two, there's also two different paths into the IT industry. One is where you, you're getting certifications, right. you're learning about things, and uh, you know you're, you're testing out for specific skills that are right, relevant right. at the moment. And then there's another path which is computer science or something like that, yeah. or or a relevant math program. And then you know you just get the degree and you're done. You know, so if there's a little more truth to it if it's the technical, if it's the te technician route, because they may not have been able to understand the core concepts, which is why they avoided the college. You know, if you go through the college, you understand the concepts, then, you know, if you understand how to compare algorithms and say which one is the best one for the job, you know, then that's something that applies no matter what the computer language is. It doesn't matter. It's still an algorithm. You're still comparing the output. You know, you have this this out input field. You have that output field. And, you know, there. Um, this one's more efficient than that one. You know, if you if you depend on you know, oh, this company's tech. You know, like a, a popular one, Cisco. Cisco makes all the routers and the network gear, and uh, they've actually converted some of the Cisco certifications into college courses, and they made it reasonably objective. But a lot of it is the vendor stuff. And that's actually starting to burn guys in the networking field now because um, they're starting to build more non-Cisco. Linux is starting to intrude in the networking field. And there's Linux-based network appliances out there. Intrude? Really, in, yeah. Interesting yeah. choice of words. Well, well, Cisco owned it. Basically, they owned the network space. But, you know, they, they're constantly raising their prices. They raise their prices yeah. a little. Some people leak over to the Linux space, you know, to the open source kind of free space where there's um, yeah, it's, it's competing a competing vendors. It's yeah, yeah. Well, free will, competition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But with the thing that sucks is for the guys that went the technical certification route, you know, especially the lower end ones. The high end ones are still very sought after, but the lower end ones are like, yeah, this isn't as easy to get a job anymore because I have to work on different equipment than I was trained on. So yeah, if you train to the equipment. So this actually brings up something interesting I wanted to, I had a, an idea for, um, um, so I wrote a, a sci-fi book. Yeah. About the yeah about the birth of nanotech into society, and of course, nice. I made it a medical thing because I uh -huh. see that is the main driver for any kind of um, bottom-up na nanotechnology. If you're building it like, if you're building a machine at the nanoscale, it's going to be medicine because the the amount of good that you can do is untold. Right, you know, you can deliver to the exact cells you're interested in. You can deliver the exact payloads you're interested in, or you know, remove whatever molecules you're interested in. If you, assuming that you had the um, the gatage on the um, the nanite to do it, you know, to recognize, okay, this molecule is this one. And I don't want that one. Um, <clears throat> so um, when I was working out. This idea, you know, a lot of people, some people in the book are sick, and that's one of the reasons, that's how the relationships all start up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things that I realized, I didn't actually put it in the book, but I, I, I realized that this is, seems almost inevitable. So right now we have all these technological silos like MRI or X ray or, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the person, the technician that works on the cardiac equipment, I don't know, what's the EKG, or the EKG technician, or you have, um, and people work on these very narrow fields. Well, in a nanotech world, it's more bottom up, right? You have one platform, and that's the technology you need to do everything, to do monitoring, to do delivery, to do removal. So at that point, it seems almost like you'd have technician-doctor pairs that would work together all the time and never essentially be partners you know, in every medical situation because it would be, it seems to me that it would be at least as complicated as the computer technical world, right? With servers and networks and you know, different net network protocols and you know, possibly encryption. I, I don't know if it would work at that scale if the computers would be fast enough. But you know, some kind of security for sure. So it would have its whole own field, and then medicine would have its own field. It just seems to me like it would be not a lot of people who could do both at the same time and keep up with both at the same time. So you would almost to in in partake in modern medicine, you'd have to when we switch to a single platform, you'd have to switch to a doctor and a computer technician side by side. I'm curious what you think about that. If you see any of that happening now, uh, any ideas, right, wrong, possible, plausible, improbable? 
Uh, I'll give you an example that I give to my <coughs> pupils, to whoever would listen to me. Okay. Um, I'm listening. Uh, We're all listening. So people who want to go to medical school, I give them this great example that I had. I had a colleague come to me, ask me a second opinion about a patient. Right. Patient had documented, proven in the office, influenza. Mm -hmm. The flu. She had the flu. Right. Lung exam was clear, this and that, you know, uh, coughing, um, you know, uh, you know, ex some expectorations. Uh, uh, alrighty, fine. And she comes back two weeks later because um, she has a fever. Mm -hmm. On the review of systems, when you ask the review systems, what we ask patients, uh, other than their chief complaint, we ask them, well, do you have diarrhea? Do you have this? Do you have that? On her review systems, she had no cough. She had no phlegm. She had some muscle aches. You know, her right hip was hurting. Uh, but she had this fever going on. And the provider did an x-ray. Mm -hmm. And the way I start this conversation with my students is, is like, why are x-rays dangerous? Well, radiation. That's the trick question for them, and that's what exactly what they say. It's not the X-rays that are the dangerous. It's it's the. Let me at least step back a second. So we do an X-ray on this patient. I got it wrong. The patient has pneumonia. <laughs> Don't worry, everyone gets it wrong. Okay, good. The, the patient has pneumonia. Right. No, no. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Let me back up. The patient has an infiltrate. Something shows up on the X-ray. Okay. A patch. Okay. That looks like pneumonia. Okay. Alrighty. And this you could answer me if you think AI will pick up on this. Um, they said, well, what should we do with this patient? Now, what do you think the computer would do, speaking from AI? Well, if it recognized uh, the, um, well, the machine learning, if it recognized the, the patch as a possible um, uh, a pneumonia, right. it, would, it would say this person needs to go needs to be put on oxygen, be put in the ER, monitored to make sure that they're breathing sufficiently. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that's it for, you know, and then more testing, you know, blood tests. Exactly. Spot on correct. Now, now I, was, I went through this with my mom, so that's why I know the answer. <laughs> but, however, here's the issue. Right. The patient has a fever, but the patient does not have a cough. The patient has no phlegm or expectoration. Mm -hmm. um, the patient lung sounds are clear. Right. The radiographic signs of pneumonia last up to 10 weeks. So four weeks after I have pneumonia, let's say I have pneumonia, ah. I get antibiotics four weeks later, I'm great, I'm at the gym, this and that. You do an x-ray, I mean, you're still gonna see the pneumonia. The pneumonia. Right. So, okay, so maybe it would have to be an at-risk category, but would the computer technician know enough to differentiate between at-risk and currently, currently uh, un underway? But here's the question. Did the pneumonia happen two weeks ago when she had the flu? and she got over the pneumonia. Because if we go on the basis that that radiograph is showing us a pneumonia, we treat a pneumonia, right. you're gonna miss the septic hip. Right. Because she had hip pain and fever. So if you take the pneumonia and the influenza, influenza only lasts about seven days in most people, 10 days. Right. Seven to 10 days. If you take that out of the equation and someone comes in and you say to any medical student, hey, the patient has fever and right hip pain, well, that's a septic joint. They know, but if this patient had the flu two weeks ago, presents with a fever now, with right hip pain, uh, muscle ache with the right hip. You know, they would just uh, separate the muscle ache and focus on the pneumonia. Oh, it's, it's pneumonia. It's on the x-ray. It's pneumonia. It has to be pneumonia. We've got to treat the pneumonia, and you're going to miss the septic hip. Uh -huh. So would AI reach a point where they'll say, hey, patient doesn't have pneumonia, patient has a septic hip, the influenza was incidental, has nothing to do with it. Well, so, so here's the thing that AI, here's the one of the reasons I think AI or machine learning is just machine, machine learning, it's well, not no, actually sure. AI right now. Right, 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 right. It's because the human conscience is a risk engine. And that's what we're good at, is figuring out risks. Like we'll look at things and okay, what are the possible negatives? And subconsciously, we'll just go and just rattle through risks. And that's yeah. something that algorithms are not up to yet. Maybe no. they will get there one day. I totally think they will, but we ain't there yet. I don't think so. <laughs> Until an algorithm has to deal with, where am I going to get my food? Where am I going to get my water? Uh, holy crap, is that a, is that a saber-toothed tiger coming up behind me? Right, Until right. it's put in one of those situations, algorithms will never be able to... Well, it's, it's, it's fuzzy logic. 
that's the problem. And computers are inherently, you know, they're one or zero. There's two choices. You know, there's everything is just uh, a long series of branches. You just add more branches when you're trying to get more out, more possible outcomes. But you know, you need to have the logic is actually different for people. You know, because you have to use fuzzy logic because what you're really doing when you're doing risk analysis is multivariable, uh, uh, multivariable equations, and they're just probability fields. You know, you but can't he, answer them definitively sometimes. Sometimes you don't know. Okay, this is a little bit bigger than this one. And then there's something else here. Okay, I'm going to go with this one because it's bigger. You know, but A, I wouldn't necessarily be able to make that call. Will it ever? I think so, but we're not, no, we're not nowhere near it yet. There are two thinkings of medicine. The, the predominant thinking is Occam's razor. Mm -hmm. The other thinking, which is not as popular, is Hickam's dictum. Which states that. <laughs> Do you laugh when I say hip up? Hiccups, hiccups dictum? Hiccups dictum. <laughs> Steve, am I pronouncing that right? <laughs> you get one of those. Uh... No, so, Mel Brooks. We've got a full circle. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me while I whip this out. <laughs> um, hiccups dictum says the patient can have as many conditions as the patient has. Mm hmm. So it's, it's always a balance between the two. Just because someone has one thing doesn't mean they don't have a second thing. Yeah, you could Occam's raise at this till the end, you know, the cows come home, but at the right. same time, they could have two different things. And uh, may I give you an example? Yeah, yes. I had a patient come in, uh, homosexual male, just came back from traveling in Vietnam and Cambodia. Okay. All righty. Present, uh, ate the local street meats. Went to the villages. <laughs> okay. <laughs> presents with left lower quadrant pain mm -hmm. and with ten rebound tenderness, meaning when you let go, it hurts more. Oh, okay. So when you say that, it's colitis. It's an infection of the colon. Okay. All righty. And you need some be antibiotics. You need a CAT scan. Uh, you need some blood work done. Right. Um, but I said, you know, he's been traveling a lot. Something was just a little tapping me in the back of my head. I tested him for influenza. He came out positive for influenza B. Okay. He was the first patient that season that I had that all the uh, predominantly influenza B loved the left lower quadrant. Mm -hmm. And any patient I had with left lower quadrant tenderness, I ran a flu test on them. Mm -hmm. And quite a few of them came back positive for influenza B. So that season, influenza B loved the left lower quadrant, which mimicked colitis. Right. Now, how do you apply this? Now, how does it, how, how was AI so, applied so this? So you, you, know, you avoided the temptation to blast them with antibiotics when it wouldn't have done any good. I'm a little different. Uh, I'm only, my philosophy is I'm only father to one person in this world, my daughter. Right. Everyone else is an adult that has to make their own decisions. Right. So you present them with information and let them choose. Exactly. Right. So it's, the, qu the choices are CAT scan, antibiotics, blood work, anti-flu treatment. One person wanted to just write it out. Other people wanted all four things. One person wanted just antibiotics. One person wanted just Tamiflu. One person just wanted a CAT scan. You know what? Every choice was appropriate because we had a discussion. Right. It looks like colitis. It smells like colitis. It walks like colitis. We have, we have a positive flu B test. And I went so far as to describe to them anchoring errors. Mm -hmm. Meaning we found hepat we found excuse me we found influenza B, and we are anchored to that diagnosis, and also search satisfaction errors in which we stop looking because we have a positive test. Right. Actually, talk. These are the words I use for my patients. Exactly these words. Right. Search satisfaction error, anchoring errors, Hickam's dictum, and Occam's razor. I use those four things with these patients with influenza B with left lower quadrant tenderness, and I said these are your choices. Could you have influenza B and a bacterial? Did they understand? what you were yeah. talking about? They got it? Okay. They have to understand before, I leave, before they leave the room. Right, right, okay. I will stay there as many hours as I need Excellent. until they understand. Thank and you I, for and doing I, that. Yeah, I said, look, you have influenza B documented. There are false positives, but mm -hmm. it's kind of rare with these tests. Uh, and you also have signs of bacterial colitis. Mm -hmm. I explained each one in turn, and I let them decide. And either way, uh, any choice was appropriate at that point because the patient was making an informed decision. So interesting. So this is so this is uh, something this is something that's been coming up in science lately. Yeah. So I think people have been misusing the terminology of science um, in in the sense that, to me, um, science is 
the ideal science is experimentation, right? Experimentation with the control. Again, we have that problem, the ethical problem with people where, you know, but how do you solve that? And you have a fairly good methodology for dealing with the ethical implications of using a person as control against themselves, which is give them the choice. Yeah. Right. Choice is the answer. Absolutely. You know, if you're looking for how to do ethical science without a control, the answer is choice. Absolutely. Right. I think there's, I think there's a larger philosophical construct at work there. I don't know if it has to do with your oath or not, but, you know, that's the good The patient, good patient has to choose. Right. It um, really, and some patients mm -hmm. don't like it. I know some patients don't like it because some patients just want, just tell me what to do. And I'm like, I can't do that. And you. you know what, and this is one of the things that's wrong with the fire ready aim, fire ready aim development model that the computer geeks are using for software development and stuff, like that piece of junk software that makes you click a million times when you shouldn't have to, because they're not giving you a choice. They're denying you the ethics that you're presenting your patients with. Fucked up. Yeah, it's, it's really fucked <laughs> pretty up. Pretty fucked up. It's really fucked up. It's like, but it, it's, there's there's a lot of paternalism in medicine. Right. Um, you know, it's you know what? It's both ways. Right. I'm the doctor. This is what you need. I'm the patient. This is what I need. Mm -hmm. I actually had a, I actually had more than one patient actually walk in the room. And here's one example. The patient looks at me and goes, "I have a UTI." I don't know why I need you to get antibiotics. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I have a UTI. I know I need antibiotics. I don't know why I need you. I'm like, you know, ma'am, I, re you know, I, I really don't know why either. Well, in the world I, of antibiotic hand soap, she has a point. <laughs> I said, I, actually, I don't know either. You should take it up with the American Medical Association and ask them. Maybe right, they can right. give you a more clear answer. In the meantime, I'm telling you, by the time she left the room, her shit turned white. When I explained to her why we have to do a urine culture, have to interpret it based on the antibiotics we give her, this and that, I give her the counseling. You know what? She got it. Some patients right. don't get it. They're right. like, I just need my antibiotics. I need to get out. Mm -hmm. And I noticed something about uh, people. I, I like to give people the choice. Some providers uh, argue with the patient. Mm -hmm. You have a cold, you don't need antibiotics. I want my antibiotics. You don't need antibiotics. I want my... And they spent five to 10 minutes arguing with the patient. Mm -hmm. So I start off with telling the patient, I'm gonna send the antibiotics to the pharmacy for you. Mm -hmm. With the adv and you could see when when they when they're talking, they they're very tense. And when you see uh, when you say I'm going to send the antibiotics to the pharmacy, their shoulders relax. And once their shoulders relax, I know I have their attention because I tried it the other way with telling them about antibiotics first. And the only thing uh, they said to me at the end is, "Do I get my antibiotics?" But once I tell them, "I'll give you your antibiotics with the advice to not use it now," they relax and they actually listen. And I tell them, "This is when you use the antibiotics." Right. If you, this is day one for day two for you, the antibiotics could help you. It's only about a two to five percent chance it'll help you. Right. If you want to roll the dice, you have the antibiotics. But I encourage you to wait for the milestones. Right. I think they're having the same reaction that a lot of the doctors are having, which is just part of the problem with our culture, with our society as a whole, is that people just have these crushing de debts, financial debts, monetary debts, yeah. and that inspires people like I can't miss a day of work. You know, I can't afford to have any time off. I can't afford to come back here. You know, unless it's life or death, I can't come back. You know, my, my, I need to be able to tell my boss I'm dying to not come back to work. So I need to get it right this time. And then it's good of you to, to, to pull them out of that, that space. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I really, um, uh, the, I, I wish consumer debt was smaller because I think that, uh, I know, wish his horse is beggars for ride. But uh, that seems to me to be the, the larger, it's a larger problem. I actually had a question. I wanted to bring something up because we were talking yeah. about ethical controls. Um, um, so vaccinations. So this is what's happening with vaccinations and people, you know, I'm not a flu vaccine person. I have had bad experiences. I've gotten sick with flu vaccines. Um, I know how it works. I know that they uh, basically take a gamble on each flu vaccine. Okay, this looks like the prominent one and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. So I don't think it's such a big Wrong. deal. Wrong? That's not well, correct. I'm sorry. What? Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go on. I was just. Kidding. I was just kidding. Okay, okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Finish your thought, please. No, no, I no. have a lot of things to say about it, but I'd like you to finish your thought. No, well, so um, uh, the problem is, so a lot of people. There's a lot of anti-vaxxers out there, and they're not vaccinating their kids with like stuff like MMRs or anything. So. Um, uh, you know, like, I don't really give a crap if people choose for themselves not to take a flu vaccine or not. Um, 
uh, because I understand the thinking, right? So if we create, a, if we stop the flu from existing, then less old people get sick and die, and then everyone's better off and less healthy, or young people, vulnerable people who actually die from it versus in the middle people where, where uh, you know, between the very young age and very old age and sick. But I, I just, um, it just seems to me that the vaccination thing is a preventable situation. So I'm thinking about 1990 when they started putting nutrition facts on food labels. And, you know, I, I, I went out and I looked on the net and I'm, I'm trying to find, so the CDD, CDC has some ingredient lists for vaccines. And, but they're just generic for the types of vaccines, not for the specific, this company's vaccine mm -hmm. is this ingredient list. Is there some reason that we can't, first of all, tell me why I'm wrong, and then hope maybe it'll completely invalidate what I'm asking, but if it doesn't, why can't we just put ingredient lists on vaccines? And do we do that already, and I just haven't seen them? Yeah, they so, do, it, yeah. Oh yeah, but I mean, is it per vaccine, or is it just per how the vaccine, is it like the ingredient list that the manufacturer roughly follows, or is it the exact percentages of each ingredient? Oh, no, no, it's, it's there, it's on the well, package insert. Do people ever ask for them when no. they come to the doctor? Should they? It seems, like, it seems like yes, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, you look at the ingredients when you buy food, you put that in your body. Yeah. Why wouldn't you look at the ingredients in your vaccine? It seems to me like yeah. a lot of these silly debates would, would, would stop if it had a thorough ingredients list and actually people actually looked at it and were able to compare like this manufacturer vaccine versus this one. There's a lot of the complaints I'm hearing out there, again, I don't know if they're valid, but are about heavy metals, specifically mercury, aluminum, things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely, it's, it's atrocious, the it, thimerosal, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so you know what I'm talking about. So, yeah. go ahead, Sh fire, I'm, my, question, my statement and question are done, so. Uh, well, first of all, you know, uh, some <coughs> patients walk in and they say, I want my vaccine. Mm -hmm. Period. Okay, very good. Let's do this. If they are pregnant or their children, I have to, I let them know first if, um, if it's a multi-dose vial, mm -hmm. meaning you get more than one dose from one vial, it has thimerosal and it's a, mer it's a mercury derivative. And I tell them very simply, the FDA says, it's okay for me to give this to you. Would I inject my own child or my own pregnant wife with it? Absolutely not. What would you like me to do? Nice, okay. It's really, and uh, to me, it's equivocal. It's not my body, it's not my child. Is there a non-thermosol alternative? Yeah. Okay, the, so the, why the hell are people using the thermosol one? That's they the really one. don't anymore. I don't think, I haven't seen it. It's all, the single dose ones usually have no preservatives right. in it. That's kind of my point. Free. It's like, you know, if there's a danger, if there's a less dangerous option that people, that invalidate those arguments, then we could stop this, you know, MMR resurgence. Yeah. You know, it just seems silly. It, like, why aren't we... <laughs> what gives, man? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when it comes to vaccines, uh, first of all, I'm not against anti-vaxxers. Uh -huh. You know, it's like they don't want to vaccinate their children, they don't want to vaccinate themselves, that's fine. It goes, I kind of am, but yeah, you kinda a little what? bit. I kind of am against them a little bit. About vaccinations? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, sympathetic to, I'm sympathetic to individual freedoms. At the same time, you know, we have a commons, we all have to live, especially living in the biggest city in the country, you know, I'm constantly rubbing elbows with people. If you've got a disease, a preventable disease, and you give it to me, fuck you. No, but but if you have the vaccine, what do you care? Right, right. But what if my kids haven't gotten it yet? You know, that kind of situation. Uh, right. Well, but you're a responsible person. You do your best. Right. Uh, right. Um, the odds are low, but it's not zero. Right. Then They've I, created a non-zero situation of a zero situation for me. So we start off with the with the with the patient who usually pregnant or just gives birth to a child. They ask me, should I vaccinate my child? Mm -hmm. That's the first yes or no, zero, one, just like AI. Yeah. Should I vaccinate? And I say, um, do me a favor, go to a reputable website that ends at .edu or .gov, and I want you to look at, learn about each vaccine, about the diseases of the vaccine, mm -hmm. and tell me if you're ready. Which fucking kill people back in the day. Yeah. If you are ready to mentally, are you mentally prepared to watch your child go through this? I've seen an eight-year-old dying from meningitis. Nice. I do not want to see so my child go through that. So they come to you with, essentially with a binary choice situation. Yes. Should I vaccinate? That's the first one. offer them a third choice. So I'll come back to he Hegel later. Okay. So keep going. Yeah. So first is the patient who asked me, should I vaccinate? And I say, go to the website. If you're prepared to watch your child go through that disease process, no. No vaccinate. Mm -hmm. That's your choice. 
if me personally, I'm not ready to see any of my children die from a preventable illness. So meningitis, for example, mm -hmm. very important vaccine. Rotavirus, for me, very important vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, when my daughter was born, I did not give her the hepatitis B vaccine at birth, which is recommended, mm -hmm. because I don't have hepatitis B. My wife doesn't have hepatitis B. Our family members don't have hepatitis B. Did you delay it? Yes. Okay, so you, until, we've done that too. Until we went to see a friend, we planned to, uh, planned to see a friend who has hepatitis B. Ah, I said, time very to organized of you. I see, I wouldn't know that. <laughs> time to vaccinate our child against hepatitis B because we're about to go into a household with someone who has hepatitis B. Right. We're going to go traveling to blah, blah, blah. Time to do the hepatitis A. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I don't want her to get hepatitis A. It's not going to kill her, but it's going to like put right. a damper on things, you know, it's... Uh... So we, we, we faced an avalanche of shots for our kids. And like, sometimes it was just one, and sometimes it was three or four to shot. And yeah. we always said, no, 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 we'll come back. We'll come yeah. back in three months. That's perfectly Let fine. Let settle in. And then that way, you know, because I was afraid of un unexpected interactions. Yeah. So, as a, as a strategy to deal with it. So, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not totally fuck you to the anti-vaxxers. I get it. I don't trust government either, you know. I don't trust. Neither do I. I don't trust the CDC. You know, I trust them to a point. I trust them to the point that I can see what they're doing. You know, and 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 to the point where I can understand what they're doing. And you know, one of the problems with 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 our facts in our society is that people can't um, people can't become experts in everything. And if you don't trust the the sources that the majority of people do trust, and you don't have time to become an expert at it, you're up a creek. But it sounds like you're bridging that gap by taking the binary choice and offering a third. Because, so have you ever heard about the Hegelian dialectic before? No. So it's this idea, it's this, it's this mechanism by which you can force people to into in a certain direction, choice-wise. And what you do is you offer them a bad choice and a really bad choice. And it's a, it's a trick. The secret is the bad choice is the one you want them to pick. So you give them a really bad choice. So if anybody's offering you a binary choice, there's right. a possibility, I'm not saying it's happening, there's a possibility that someone is using the key galleon dialectic against you. So you can demand a third choice. You know, applying it to politics too, right? You know, this is one of the reasons I'm a huge I'm a huge proponent of third parties. I think that would just fix it. You know, if we if we were if we created a system that would encourage third parties, it, the problems would be over. So, but anyway, so good job in, in breaking up the Hegelian dialectic and uh, yeah. hopefully discouraging people from running off a cliff with vaccines. It, it, you know, life's about balance. It's about risk. What? Or segways. Or segways. Segways. <laughs> I forgot about that. Pickle Rick. Pickle Rick. Segways. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, vaccines, it's a very personal choice. See, my thing is I'm really freedom of choice in educating patients. Right. Because if we start mandating vaccines, you just go down that where does it end kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, what are you going to do? Ah, uh, you're familiar you're with gonna go to, slippery slope. You're yes. going to go tie down people to mm -hmm. a table and vaccinate them? Is that what we're going to do? It's like, where where do you draw that line? Yeah, I've read sci-fi where, where vaccinations were used as a ruse to do other things biologically to people. And people believe that, by the way. Yeah. yeah. My, oh, my, yeah. my patients don't want to, some patients don't want to get vaccinated because they think it's part of some grand some, scheme. Right, right. You're going to sterilize me or, you know. Sterilization is one of them. Yeah. Um, uh, that, was the, that was the sci-fi scenario. Ca causing, uh, causing disease It was actually a very term. good book, uh, Gate to Women's Country. Uh, I actually read it in ethics in college. And uh, it's, a, you know, like, okay, what if men really are super violent? You know, and need to be uh, isolated. So they had devised a scheme where they were dividing the men into uh, the violent ones would go off into like a, a, a soldier camp, and the peaceful ones would choose to stay in the city and help the women. And uh, yeah, sorry, I spoiled it. Uh, anyway, there's there's more to it, but uh, yeah, they when they were giving them checkups, they weren't giving them checkups. 
the men in the, yeah. the barracks. Look, look. Do you do you blame people? Look how many atrocities were done in United States medicine. The Tzatziki experiment, for mm -hmm. example. Right. Um, where they monitor, where they did not tell African Americans that they had syphilis. It's a oh, that, that's a fucking disaster. I can't believe that's real. No, that's real. I, I, I know. I know it's real. I just can't believe it. It's yeah, it's absolutely real. And it's like, well, what do you expect? What? What do you expect people, any people, for any yeah. disease? What do you expect any person to feel uh, as as a culture, as a race, as an ethnicity, if someone did something to their people based on some criteria? We all know from the medical books from the time of Hippocrates what neurosyphilis is and what it does. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, not Hippocrates. I'm exaggerating. But since we we figured yeah, yeah, out what yeah. syphilis was, we know what it does. There's no reason to run that experiment on people. Yeah, just just you didn't know? have the sequence of that particular cancer doesn't mean we didn't know what cancer was. Right, exactly. Cancer in, 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 in ancient Greek times, right? Yeah, exactly. It, was, it looked like a crab on the... That's the yeah, when, when they when they cut the cancer open, even now when you cut the cancer open, it looks like a crab. Right, uh, right. So that's why it's called cancer. That's it's pretty good. Um, uh, cool. That was a great answer. I was uh, I was afraid I was ambushing you a little with that because I was no ambush away. I like ambushes. Okay, cool. Look, I, if, I, if I don't know, I'm just gonna say I don't know. I don't. So. Right, right. You know how many um, times I use, I tell patients a day? I don't know. <laughs> um, so how do you deal with? Uh, I know there's a lot of push on. All right, one more thing, and then I'm going to come to the big one, which is the thing that you wanted to talk about. Um, yeah. uh, I think you know what I mean. Um, so uh, I, I, w I just wanted to ask about drug companies and, and pushing, you know, handing free sa samples out to doctors and coming up with partnerships with doctors' offices. What do you think about that? Any input? Have you had no. any... Have you just said no to them and said, get out of here? Have you oh had my. good experiences, you know? Um, with um, the samples that they, you know, because of course the yeah. pharmaceutical industry is constantly trying to resolve the same problem because of course the new solution's under patent, the old solution isn't, you know. Uh, oh, I, I loved them when I was in private practice. Really? It was awesome. It, it was medication for my patients. Right, free medication. And I, I would tell them, I said, listen, um, you want to come visit me, you got to bring me a lot of samples and coupons for my patients. Right. Oh, and you also have to get lunch for the staff once a month. Nice. And I, I tell them, it's like, this is what you have to do uh, if you want to enter. So it was a good deal, you think, overall? Overall, as long as they could have an intellectual conversation with me. Ah, it's not. Like it's, <laughs> I didn't prescribe their medication. I told them, I said, listen, if you want me to prescribe your medication, besides strong arming you into you know lunch and samples, right? You really got to tell me why your medication. And I would put time aside. I would put half an hour aside for a rep and sit there and tell me why your medication is better than the other ones. So they didn't know their. They didn't know their craft. They didn't know the, what their they shit. were selling. They didn't know their shit. They didn't know their shit, yeah. One time, I remember, <coughs> this, this, one, uh, this one rep, she, she says, oh, and by the way, she was selling some other medication. By the way, I'm going to give you this box of prenatal vitamins. I'm going to give you some prenatal vitamins. Right. I said, oh, prenatal vitamins. I picked this up. I look at it. I'm like, flip it over in the back. I'm like, and I, lo I look at the back, and I, I look at her, and I say, I say, are you fucking shitting me? <laughs> she froze like she became pale she's like what I'm like you're giving red dye and blue dye to a pregnant woman <laughs> I said are you out of your fucking mind and she goes to me this is you know this, this is exactly how I spoke with her All right it's like you put you put this thing in front of me with dye I'm like she, she goes she goes I, I, I didn't I didn't know it was in there I'm like that's even worse. You don't know what's in your own fucking samples you're giving me. I'm like, is this shit in the vitamins that you give pregnant woman? If if I if I prescribe this and the pharmacist gives these medications, are you putting this shit in? It? Is the same stuff? She goes, y y yes. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I was like, get the fuck out of my office. <laughs> I said, don't ever come back here with any of your fucking drugs. Nice. But come back with your free lunch. That's fine. All right. Yeah. <laughs> no, but as long as you guys didn't put it together, as long as you bought it someplace local and you didn't put any dye in it. <laughs> you know, it's but it's just it's like I'm very against dyes. Yeah. 
uh, I'm against thimerosal, I'm against dyes. Yep. And it's so hard, even for when I go shopping for my, for my daughter, for ibuprofen and you know, acetaminophen, and it's like die, 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 die. It's like, what the fuck, you know? Right. It's, it's like, I just can't find something that's die. I've, now I found something that's die free, but right. you know, it's like all this extra. It's all the marketing. You, know, you want to make it the right color. The th things like thimer for me, dyes are, are on par with thimerosal. Really? Yes. We don't wow. know. We don't I'm know what they do. Not expecting that. We don't know what they, all this food coloring. Yeah. All this garbage. We really don't know what it does. Do you notice how it just sticks to your skin when you pick out? Yes. And it makes your skin red. Yes. What red or blue to, or. Right. Whatever. What happens to our mucous membranes? Are inside of our gastrointestinal tract, and once these dyes get absorbed. They're gonna, they're gonna, they might go into the brain. I don't need any more conspiracy theories, man. It's not conspiracy. I'm talking just biochemistry. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> well, no, I was like, why are they doing it? Nobody why? ever thought of this before. This you know, you know why? Right. They, they did this is only a two and a half hour conversation. We we're already talking about this. How do they not talk about this? <laughs> you know, because you know what they did actually did studies where they took uh, they took two groups of patients. They did uh, they drew up the vitamin B12 injection that right. was not red. And they drew up a vitamin B12 injection that was red. Right. And you have to watch, the patient has to watch you draw it up. The patients who saw the red vitamin B12 reported feeling much better than the patients who did not get the red vitamin Fucking B12. Fucking Edward Bernays. That's what that is. It's marketing. It's marketing. Why, yep. why, does, why, does, why does all my medicine have to be red? Yeah. Why, why does it have to be red? Why does it have to be blue? Right. Uh, Mucinex. Right. You know, it's, it's blue. It's like it's a blue literally, It's literally like snake oil. <laughs> because red is danger psychologically, right? And, you know, that's, that snake oil, was that was the whole angle, is that that poison had some magic in it, right? Yeah. Yes, the color red da, has da, the magic. Da, da, da. Rabbit of the hat. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, I mean, is this, is this all just, is this really, is this business so that morbid? I mean, yeah. You know, is it, so. I, I know you've mentioned this a couple times, and I really wanted to talk about it, but I wanted to save it toward, till towards the end, no. in case it got dark. But it's let's important. get dark, man. Let's talk about the suicides. Let's talk about suicide. Why are why do doctors kill themselves? Why do dentists kill themselves? Denti why do I, veterinarians kill themselves? I, you know, I, I don't know why do dentists. Uh, well, I mean, I mean my, a, my theory is a doctor is killed himself across the street from my house, in the, in the house across the street. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, why? It just seems like they're so important. Why is this happening? Because <laughs> it's not about everyone else. It's a, it's about them. Right. You know, it's uh, as opposed to you know what we usually tell people. It's not about you. It's about everyone else. You know, uh, you know, suicide is a very personal decision. Mm -hmm. um, it is considered, for the most part, uh, depending how you look at it, it, it's looked upon as a psychotic episode because it goes against preservation of life. Right. It's a loss of the sense to preserve one's life. Some people will look at it as... Is, um, it, is it just the stigma of mental illness? Is that why it's just tossed aside? Who knows? Right. And I say who knows because every form that I fill out as a physician for hospital privileges, for medical licensure in the state, any employer says, do you have any men me mental illnesses? Mm -hmm. or medical, uh, medical illnesses that would interfere with your job to become a physician. What am I going to do? I'm going to check yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's like, yeah, it's 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 a friend dark. Of mine was it's a cop, he's like, one of the questions on the freaking test is like, do clouds chase you? Yeah, I'm gonna write yes on that. Okay. Exactly. It's like <laughs> even I, if they do, I'm gonna write yes on that. I don't know what that question means, but I know I know I, know, I, know I how I have to answer that. Right, uh, right. Multiple uh, guess. <laughs> so what I you know I spoke with some psychiatrists. Um, I, I've actually dealt with suicidal physicians. Mm. You need you need physicians to deal with suicidal physicians. You can't have. I mean, you, you need a peer. You need a peer, right? You, you, okay. you know what? I appreciate what these hotlines do. Right. But really, when someone, if you have a, let's say, a seasoned trauma surgeon, right, who wants to kill themselves, they don't want to hear someone who's in college or out of high school tell them why it's okay to live. Dude, spring break is the best. Yo, you know, it's like, <laughs> no, it's like. You got to get on the course train, man. No, yeah. no. You know, no. just because you could train a dog doesn't mean you could step in a, a, a cage and train a tiger. You know, they're, right. they're different animals. Same principles, different animals. Right. Got to know how to act around them. Right, fair enough. Um, and you know what? It, it's very hard to look at someone 
And if you, let's say like someone in the IT field, if they told me, well, you know, it, every just working with you know the blah 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 server just makes me want to kill myself, and it has a depressing sound to the server. I'm give, whatever. Right. It's like I can't comment on that. It's like users, they're the ones. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. out of my field. You know, it's like. Sounds right. like you should talk to someone, you know, but it's not me, you right. know, it's, uh, you know, so a physician. That's true, yeah, absolutely. No one would know what the problems of an IT guy are right. if, they, if they hadn't had any experience in the right. computer field at all. Like like people like people who are alcoholics who go through the 13-step process, mm -hmm. you need another alcoholic to, to, to guide you through it. Right. A recovering alcoholic because they've been through it. The same thing with physicians. You need a physician who's been through it, who's been through the sleep the sleepless nights, who has held the, pa the hands of dying patients. Uh, who has seen kids die? Who you know? You need someone who's been through it to say, "Yeah, man, that kind of sucks." Right. But let's look at it from this point of view. So I actually heard a great um, quote recently. I, I've forgotten the name of the guy that that wrote the book about it, but I think he's right uh, that addiction is really just a lack of connection. And it seems like suicides, or, you know, pro being prone to suicide is very much the same thing. If you don't have that connection with people who are like-minded or in the same space. Who can you know contribute something new to your life that you you just you it makes you miserable you just your life is pain and you could self medicate right which becomes addiction yes right? whether it's endorphin hits on social media or yeah. you know um, uh, alcohol or whatever and um, uh, you could just end it you know because you can't take it anymore so yeah I mean I don't. I don't know if you would have thought about that. If you think that, I think that's probably true. The addiction is a, an opposite, the opposite of connection. But I could see that. I could see your point of view. Yeah. You know, because you're sort of you're 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 uh, involuting into yourself, into your addiction. Uh, unless, of course, you, you you bring other people into it. Right. I mean, I, you know, I'm not saying chemical addictions aren't real. I'm just saying, you know, they oh, may be, they may become they may take over after a while. Right, so it starts off as a psychological problem and then it becomes chemical. But, um, um, uh, and of course, there's the chemistry within the body. I'm talking, you know, that's the differentiation I've made during this show is, you know, external chemical, pouring chemicals into yourself versus the ones you can produce on your own. Um, but the pouring of the chemicals, I, I need to go back and I really need to emphasize, it could come through the eyes as well. Right. The chemicals, the, the, the frequencies, the blue yes. light, the dopamine triggering. <coughs> It yes, doesn't yes, matter. Mouth, yes, IV, eyes, it's all right. the same yeah, thing. You know, I like your view better. It's more holistic. No. My, mine's, mine's was a little immature. Um, no, no I, I liked your point of view as well. But <laughs> okay. I just want to really emphasize um, the fact that since smartphones came out, right. the feelings, like you mentioned, sorry, I didn't mean to point at you, the feelings of... It's not uh, my fault, man! The feelings <laughs> of... Uh, you, there's a graph. The feelings of isolation... Mm -hmm. In the, in, the, in the adolescent population has skyrocketed. Right. Because no matter how connect, the more connected they get, the more isolated they feel. Right. And all, of course, suicidality in adolescence is also going up. It's even a problem with geeks. It's even a problem with the people who logically, this is one of the reasons I think I constantly tell people logic isn't a panacea. Because I, it's, it's a problem with the people who logically know how it works. Yeah. You know? I mean, you know, a geek knows in a deep way that a lot of other people don't appreciate what an email is. You know, there's just no emotional metadata in there whatsoever. You know, I mean, there's, you know, all right, maybe you can use exclamation points and, and, and caps, but, you know, I, I tell people constantly you have to emote, you know, uh, smiley faces and stuff like that. But even then, you know, it's a yeah. very narrow channel. There's very little very bandwidth. Narrow. You know, all the little cues, the auditory, all the visual cues, you know. And it's sad. No. A good percentage of my text messages, actually, I write back to people, say, hey, you said this. Do you mean it like this or like this? I can't tell by your text message. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's totally, there's, there's whole memes about that. There's yeah. like, there's waves of memes about um, um, yeah. uh, how people wrote something in, you know, a comma takes a, a kindness to a disaster. Yeah, no, <laughs> can, no, you can exactly. get fired because of a comma. <laughs> because of a comma, right? Exactly. And uh, it's, you know, you send a message to you know ten different people, and some people could be like, "Wow, what an asshole," and the other people are like, "Wow, that was so funny." You know? Right, right. Is is it just that? The, is it just like the fact that we're? Is it partially just the fact that we're just a bunch of meat bags, and that being a doctor reinforces that? You know, when you're literally dealing with fixing people's meat. 
you know, the, the, the flesh that makes a human being, that we're just all these, these finite, limited, um, this limited run creatures that just eventually expire? Is it just headed home every day? Because is that what it is? Is that part of it? Or? It's, it's, how they, uh, it's how people view themselves. If they want it's, to view so it's not about what they're seeing outside themselves. It's how they view themselves. So maybe they feel like they can't help enough? Or? How they view themselves is how they view the outside, the outside of themselves. It's the same thing. Okay. It's really, it's the internal, the, what we see in ourselves is how we also perceive the world. If I, am, if I am smart and confident and beautiful, the world is nice. If I'm stupid and I'm shameful and I can't believe I'm always fucking up, the world's going to be bad. Right. You know, you know, you know, you know that song. People are strange. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, you know, what, you know the doors. Exactly. Yeah. You know, faces are ugly when you're strange, and yeah, uh, women are wicked. Women are wicked wanted. when you're not exactly. Women are wicked when you're not wanted, but when you're wanted, life is good. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, so it's it's all about how one views themselves, but there's a balance because you don't want to go off the deep end of, you know, going to that narcissistic kind of. Whoa, right. Right. I'm the best. You know, things in sliced bread. You know. There, there's a balance between feeling confident, uh, being egotistical, a and having a, uh, a battered ego. Right. There, there's that. Uh, there's that balance that we have to strive So, so for. tell me about the organization that you're starting for um, uh, suicide prevention or uh, it, trying to help other doctors or. Yeah, I spoke with a few psychiatrists, and I'm trying to I'm trying to get a system going, in which a physician can present to a psychiatrist. And just not even use their name. Make up a name. Hi, I'm Bob. Right. I, I'm a trauma surgeon. I want to kill myself. I'm bad shape. The psychiatrist will never ask the physician their name. So there's nothing like this right now? No, no, no. You have to give your name, your whatever, your insurance oh, wow. card, whatever. So you go in there and say, I don't want to identify myself. Mm -hmm. This is who I am. This is what I do. This is what I feel. The pa I, in my head, the patient gets a number, kind of mm -hmm. like a Swiss bank account. Mm -hmm. You lose your number, you lose your bank account. Sorry. Right. You know, and this way, whoever wants to come and review the records, you have a number attached to the record. Who's right. the patient? I don't know who the patient is. Right. But That's excellent. It's great, but people don't want that. People want your name and your date of birth and, you know, fill out a form. And, yeah. and all of a sudden there's a record. And nobody right. wants their name attached to a record where they're feeling, they go to a psychiatrist. Hi, I'm a trauma surgeon. I feel suicidal. Right. You know, that's bad. It's bad in the sense that if you tell that to any administrator in the hospital, you tell that to anyone who has a hiring capacity for a physician, they will not hire that physician. That's terrible. It's, it's it's atrocious. Wow. So I would personally... It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes. You literally can't have emotions or you're, you're, you're blackballed. Right. Or, or and, and you know, oh, look how oh, he's, he's laughing at the party. Look how much he drinks. He's drinking a bottle of wine. My, he's, he's, you know, he's funny. It's funny when he drinks. But it's, it's, a, it's a type of self-medication for some people. Right. So it's like, it's, so alcohol is perfectly acceptable. And nicotine is perfectly acceptable. Now CBD is acceptable. Mm -hmm. Um... But people use it, even physicians use it to overcome their pain. Right. And that's a vicious circle because it puts so, them in so a more depressed state. So I really state. like your idea because yeah. one of the reasons that I think it will work is because I think that um, inherently that the problem, if, if addiction is a lack of connection, then um, uh, freedom, um, friendship is the answer to that. Right? And friendship, one of the core components of friendship is freedom. Friendship is just giving someone the freedom, giving someone else freedom, but also allowing them to make occasional mistakes, like wanting to hurt yourself, you know, and continuing to be their friend in, in spite of that. So, um, yeah, I mean, based on that, you know, by giving them that connection unconditionally, you're essentially giving them. Um, an anonymous friendship, or the qualities of it. Yeah. The you know you can tell us about what's going on in your life, and we will not judge you. Yeah. And that 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 should solve it. So yeah, I mean I hope you I hope you succeed with that. If there's anything I can do, if you need you know geeks, 
I know geeks. Yeah, well, I know Lee, Lee knows geeks too. We know <laughs> geeks. So, <laughs> you know, the the, the problem, you know, the thing is, and we know lawyers. So, and you put it very right. It, it's about it's about uh, it's about connection, and it's really about having a safety net and really feeling safe. Right. And most of the time, you know, if and studies were done, um, it was very interesting. I was listening to an audio book about this, and they mentioned, um, oh, I forgot who it was, um, a famous. I think it was Tolstoy, uh, Steve. It was Tolstoy, whose brother put him in a corner and told him, "Don't think of a white bear." What? Don't think of right now. Don't think of a white bear. Uh, when did he stop beating your wife? <laughs> <laughs> right? You know? Yeah. You know? So it's kind of like so. The problem is. It's the same problem. The right? same problem. You know? You just it, can't stop visualizing this. If you you need to give yourself permission to feel that. You need to give yourself permission. It's okay to go through it. You need to give yourself permission to say, hey, it's normal to have these feelings. Because if you try to repress it, it's this vicious, don't think about the white bear kind of wind up. Right, right. And it becomes some shameful, it becomes an intrusive thought, a recurring thought. I have really appreciated our time together. Thank you so much for coming on my show. Thank you so much for having me. And um, uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, Dr. Uh, where is uh, Kachoba, right? Is that right? Yeah. Kachoba? Yes. Kachoba. Yes. All right, Thanks. I got it right. Thank Pickle, you so much. Pickle Rick! Pickle Rick! <laughs> Please come on again. And um, Thank you. Good night, everyone, and we'll, uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks again.